Finance Committee will come to order. Uh, colleagues, I'm going to take just a minute uh, to thank the members for what I believe has been a very productive work period. Our bipartisan efforts on organ transplants, thank you very much, Senator Grassley, have really pay, uh, paid off. We're going to have new contracting practices with much more accountability to protect the millions of Americans who depend on these organ transplants. Senator Cardin and Senator Daines yesterday focused on dental uh, care. Senator Crapo and uh, both sides are working uh, to build on our mental health work. I thought we had a very good and bipartisan housing hearing that uh, proceeded uh, in the middle of, uh, of the work period. Uh, in my uh, state, eight different school districts are having to buy houses to rent to teachers because there's such a housing shortage. And then finally, yesterday, the investigation, a two-year investigation by the Finance Committee exposed massive federal tax evasion by Credit Suisse, working with ultra-wealthy Americans, often dual citizens, who are hiding their taxes, concealing their tax obligations for years on end. So colleagues, thanks, and it was a productive uh, time. This morning, we're going to continue our longstanding efforts to lower the cost of health care for taxpayers and patients. Today, the committee focuses on pharmacy benefit managers, in particular, the new strategies like charging administrative fees tied to the price of a drug that these multi-billion dollar corporations have aggressively, aggressively adopted in the last four years since we had previously looked at PBMs. Pharmacy benefit managers had a strong case for themselves back in the 1980s and 1990s. The original goal was to use their access to limited data to negotiate lower drug prices on behalf of their citizens, on behalf of their clients, insurance companies, and employers. When prescription drug coverage came to Medicare with Part D in the 2000s, PBMs shifted into overdrive to get to a larger market and more sophisticated drugs. In recent years, it's been increasingly apparent that PBMs are using their data, their market power, and their know-how to keep prices high and pad their profits instead of sharing the benefits of the prices they negotiate with consumers in the Medicare program. I believe this is an industry that is going in the wrong direction, and that's having a big impact on the prices that Americans pay at pharmacy counters from one end of the country to another. There are especially serious consequences for the federal health programs that the Finance Committee oversees between Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP, and the individual health insurance market. The committee oversees health coverage for more than half of all Americans, or roughly 180 million people. Prescription spending for these Americans constitutes a significant portion of the amount the United States as a whole spends on pharmace pharmaceuticals each year. That totals $577 billion in 2021. <clears throat> That's why it's so critical for the committee to examine what needs to be done to modernize the rules of the road for PBMs. Senator Crapo and I have talked about this at some length, particularly on this concept <clears throat> of modernizing uh, the rules, because what made sense really 30, 40 years ago doesn't look so sensible today, and so we're taking off on this hearing, as with so many of the things that I just outlined over this work period, with strong bipartisan interest, and I thank Senator Crapo for that. So what we're going to have to do is look at pharmacy benefit managers with a thorough eye and take any legislative steps necessary to ensure taxpayers and patients aren't getting a raw deal. The Finance Committee has a long history of tackling these big league issues on a bipartisan basis and the results speak for themselves. Finally, before I turn it over to Senator Crapo, I want to illustrate just one example of PBM practices that's resulting in high prices. In a competitive market, if two products have equal quality, a business should prefer the lower cost option. However, oftentimes PBMs charge administrative fees to drug makers, which are calculated as a percentage of a drug list price. That means PBMs get a higher payment if they favor higher cost drugs. In my view, that's a clear example of these bizarre, these perverse incentives 
The PBMs have created this, that has left so many Americans fed up and outraged at the healthcare system. And the consequences of this out of whack market are felt by taxpayers and families every time they show up at the prescription counter. Discounts negotiated by PBMs play an important role in driving down premiums for seniors. But the games PBMs play behind the scenes also appear to be driving up drug costs for many seniors who are forced to pay top dollar for their prescriptions at the pharmacy counter while PBMs profit at their expense. So we've got an important opportunity today to look at the latest practices, the most current practices being employed by pharmacy benefit managers and the impact that these tactics have on taxpayers and Americans who count on affordable medicine affordable medicine for a decent quality of life. <clears throat> Thanks to all our witnesses, <clears throat> Senator Crapo, please, and I thank you for your cooperation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I've long championed efforts to improve prescription drug access and affordability for all Americans, and I welcome the opportunity to engage in this vitally important bipartisan hearing. Whether at the pharmacy counter, the doctor's office, or the hospital, some of the most life-saving medications remain out of reach for far too many working families and seniors, especially in the face of persistent inflation. Congress took critical, a critical step toward addressing these challenges nearly 20 years ago when we voted to enact Medicare's Prescription Drug Benefit, or Part D leveraging market-based competition to create a, and protect high-quality coverage for seniors. In many ways, Medicare Part D reflects an unprecedented success story, coming in massively under budget, with low and stable monthly premiums, and with a generic drug dispensing rate of roughly 90 percent. Part D's resilient, market-oriented structure continues to ensure low-cost drug access for most seniors even as many other medical costs have continued to skyrocket. Stakeholders across the supply chain deserve credit for these figures and trends. That said, much has changed in the past two decades, and we have an obligation to both build on the aspects of Part D that work well and to address access and affordability gaps where we find them. In weighing and developing policy solutions, my priority is always the patient. We need to identify avenues for lowering out-of-pocket costs, increasing competition, and promoting access to life-saving innovation. And we need to do so in a fiscally responsible manner. Given the tremendous common ground and shared goals around this issue, I'm confident that we can fulfill these objectives and deliver real results for seniors. A few major points regularly raised by Idahoans, transparency, incentives, and out-of-pocket costs are of key importance as we hear today's testimony. As anyone who has looked at a flowchart or a diagram of the drug supply chain can attest, the only clear thing a bit about it is how unclear and opaque it is. We need an all of the above approach to transparency that empowers consumers, plans, providers, and pharmacies to make informed, cost-effective, and clinically appropriate decisions as well as to practice meaningful oversight. Policymakers also need more line of sight into the black box of drug pricing relationships and transactions, especially as we look to pursue productive reforms in the future. We also need to assess the various incentives that operate within the medication supply chain. Ideally, we should have frameworks, both within Part D and in other markets, that encourage low prices through meaningful competition. Unfortunately, in too many cases, certain dynamics seem to drive list prices up, as the chairman has mentioned, even as net prices, reflective of rebates and discounts, decline. The gap between list and net price has grown dramatically in recent years, keeping premiums stable, but exposing some consumers to astronomical out-of-pocket costs at the pharmacy counter particularly for uninsured patients or families relying on high deductible health plans. Misaligned incentives have also constrained biosimilar uptake in Part D, driving manufacturers to launch products at multiple different price points, with PBMs sometimes preferencing the option with the higher sticker price. The incentive structures at play here clearly warrant a hard look. 
Americans face an out-of-pocket cost of less than $20 for 92% of the prescriptions filled. For the remainder, however, costs can run much higher, particularly for seniors enrolled in Part D. I look forward to discussing targeted solutions to bridge this gap without fueling premium hikes for older Americans. With these priorities in mind, thank you to our witnesses for your being here today, and I do look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Senator Crapon. I'm listening to you and comparing it to those five areas that I, I touched on where we've been working in a bipartisan way. This is especially important because people find this at the pharmacy counter in communities all across the country. So we, uh, we look forward to having the majority and minority work uh, together. Let me briefly introduce our witnesses, Robin Feldman, JD. She's a national expert on drug pricing, competition, innovation, and the law. She teaches at UC College of the Law, San Francisco, where she's the Arthur Goldberg Distinguished Professor of Law, holds the Albert Abramson 54 Distinguished Professor of Law Chair. And with apologies to Dr. Feldman and our other witnesses, I'm going to be brief because I think we have so many things going on today. I think you all have wonderful uh, backgrounds. I'm just going to try to condense this a little bit. Karen Van Nuys is next. She holds multiple positions at the U.S. Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics, including Center Fellow, Senior Fellow and Executive Director of the Value of Life Sciences Innovation Program. Lawton Robert Burns will be next. Dr. Burns is a professor of health care uh, management, professor of management and the, J and the James Jew Jin, professor at the University of Pennsylvania Wharton with a special focus on studying health strategy. Uh, Jonathan uh, Levitt is with us. Uh, he's co-founder of Friar Levitt, a boutique healthcare law firm. He's dedicated his practice to representing pharmacies, dispensers, provider associations, manufacturers, wholesalers, and plan sponsors. We welcome him. And Mr. Matthew Gibbs is with us, a president of Capital Rx, a pharmacy benefit manager that operates with a fully transparent flat fee uh, disruptor. He's responsible for several core operations at Capital Rx, which cut across client relations, benefit design, customer support, and clinical services. <clears throat> With apologies for abbreviating all of your very distinguished backgrounds, I just ask unanimous consent that a more complete record of their background be made a part of the record. Okay, let's begin with you, um, Dr. Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and esteemed members of the committee. The supply chain for medicine is riddled with perverse incentives and marked by skyrocketing prices. Key aspects of the problem can be traced to the industry that lies at the center of drug pricing, pharmacy benefit managers, or PBMs. Historically, PBMs were just claims processors handling the paperwork, but 15 years ago, when Medicare expanded to include prescription drugs, PBMs offered to help health plans negotiate with drug companies for better prices. But instead of prices coming down, the prices of many drugs have increased dramatically. For example, the prices of 65 common medicines have almost tripled just during that 15-year period. Now, there are many contributing factors, but PBMs have been in the middle of it. So how did this happen? How did PBMs, who are supposed to help bring prices down, end up driving prices higher instead? Well, rather than act as honest brokers for the health plans, PBMs have unsurprisingly acted in their own self-interest. And as it turns out, their own interests are not aligned with lower prices. But quite simply, higher prices put more, po more dollars into a PBM's pockets. When the sticker price goes up for a drug, and the PBM negotiates a rebate. The PBM appears successful. It's a little like a department store that raises the price of a coat before putting it on sale. The markdown looks great when you walk in, but it's not. In addition, the PBMs often keep a percentage of the rebate, so it gets to pocket more, again, based on the price. Now, all this might not be so bad um, if no one actually paid that high sticker price, but as Senator Crapo pointed out, many people do. Uh, many plans, the out-of-pocket comes as a percentage of that high sticker price, and that's very difficult. And, and many Americans don't have prescription drug coverage, even if they do have health insurance. Now, I mentioned raising the price of a drug I'm sorry, raising the price of a coat before you put it on sale. But it gets worse. 
So imagine if the price jump is higher than the sale discount. That's what's happening with medicine. Between 2010 and 2017 in Medicare, prices for drugs after rebate, we're talking about after rebate, still rose 313% on average. So we're buying the same coat, but we are paying more and more, and a significant chunk of that increase is going to the PBMs. Now, a PBM may be brokering deals for the health plan, but it's a very strange relationship. <laughs> the PBMs refuse to give the details of the deals they are making to their own clients, the health plans. And given their monopoly over pricing information and the fact that only three PBMs control most of the market, PBMs are setting the terms of almost every arrangement, and it is not a free and fair market despite the fact that PBMs should be serving as honest brokers for the health plans, PBMs also ask drug companies for side payments. And again, those payments rise when the price of drugs rise, and that creates perverse incentives. And they vigorously deny having a fiduciary or any other type of duty to act in the best interests of the health plan and its patients. <clears throat> so at the end of the day, what do PBMs do to protect their income stream of rebates and payments. Well, PBMs stand at the center. They're the benefit managers. As well as negotiating the prices, PBMs help decide if patients will be reimbursed and how much they will be reimbursed. So when dealing with drug companies, PBMs can offer to exclude a drug company's competitors or to make it more difficult for patients to get the competitor's medicine. You know, as a result, and this is where we end up, Less expensive medicines are disadvantaged, and patients are channeled into higher-priced drugs. Although the pharmaceutical supply chain is a complex system, the overview of these aspects of the problem can be summarized fairly simple. PBMs are able to exploit their role at the center to extract dollars and channel the system into higher-priced drugs. That's the core of the problem. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Well said. Uh, let's go next to Dr. Van Nice. Thank you, Chairman Wyden, Ranking Member Crapo, and honorable members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the practices of pharmacy benefit managers. My name is Karen Van Nuys, and I am an economist and senior fellow at the Leonard D. Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics at the University of Southern Excuse me. Sorry. Excuse me. Could you hear me? Oh. All right. Um, I am an, an economist and a senior fellow at the Leonard D. Schaefer Center for Health Economics at the University of Southern California. Um, the opinions I offer here today are my own and build on previous statements and publications. At the Schaefer Center, we've been studying prescription drugs for over a decade, and we're among the first research institutions to quantify the role of intermediaries in that market. PBMs provide important and much needed services to drug companies, insurers, employers, and patients, and sit in the middle of nearly every tra financial transaction. This position provides them with extraordinary information access and leverage. As ha has been widely reported, the PBM industry has become larger and more vertically integrated. Four out of five US prescriptions are now handled by the top three PBMs. While their size may allow them to negotiate lower drug prices, it also positions them to suppress competition and raise drug costs. Which of these two possibilities prevails is ultimately an empirical question that our research seeks to answer. Estimating money flows in this market can be challenging because much of the needed data is opaque to outsiders. That said, drug price researchers have been conducting these studies that shine slivers of light into the dark corners of the system. From these glimpses, we can assemble a collage of the overall picture. And here are some things we've learned in assembling that collage. First, in some circumstances, PBMs raise drug costs. We compared what Medicare paid for the most common generic drugs with what those same prescriptions would have cost cash-paying members at Costco. We found that Medicare could have saved $2.6 billion in 2018 on just 184 drugs if they had been purchased without insurance at Costco. S somehow, involving the PBM 
and, and the health plan in the transaction increased drug costs by 21%. Second, in some branded markets, when PBMs negotiate savings from manufacturers, they don't always pass those along to patients and taxpayers. My Schaefer colleagues and I studied the money flows from U.S. insulin sales between 2014 and 2018. While PBMs negotiated a 31% reduction in net payments to manufacturers, the total amount spent per unit of insulin barely budged. Instead, intermediaries, including PBMs, were capturing those savings. In 2014, intermediaries were taking 31 out of every $100 spent on insulin. Five years later, they were claiming $53, more than half. PBM share alone grew 155% in five years. PBMs use commercial tactics like copay clawbacks, spread pricing, and strategic formulary placement to do this. This leads to perverse outcomes, including patients' copays exceeding the cost of the drug on one in four prescriptions, and plans paying on average 31% markups for generic scripts. PBMs motivate manufacturers to compete for formulary placement through rebates. PBMs often keep a share, leading them to prefer drugs with higher rebates. So manufacturers offer higher rebates, raising list prices to accommodate them. Consequently, this form of competition pushes prices up rather than down, and formularies can end up favoring the highest, not lowest, cost drug. High list prices have real consequences for patients. Those without insurance may pay list prices directly. Those with insurance may still be exposed in the deductible phase or through coinsurance payments. Passing rebates through to health plans creates its own problems for patients. Health plans may use them to lower premiums, but this decreases the effective generosity of coverage. It transfers resources from sick patients to healthy beneficiaries. Finally, the current rebate-focused price negotiation process can generate counterintuitive formulary designs. For example, researchers found that 72% of Medicare formularies place at least one branded product on a lower cost sharing tier than its generic. Some biosimilar manufacturers are finding that it is easier to get biosimilars with high list prices and high rebates onto formularies compared to identical products with lower prices. While it is true that PBMs provide values, valuable services, the lack of transparency in the transactions they control, the misaligned incentives that govern their behavior, and vertical consolidation in the PBM industry should be concerning to us all. Increased transparency that gives market participants more equal footing in price negotiations would help level the playing field. And stricter reporting requirements for more granular transaction data would allow regulators to analyze specific markets and tactics, identify problems more quickly, and provide us with more targeted solutions. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. about your test. <laughs> We're serious okay. about this. Dr. Burns. Well, good morning. Thank you, Chairman Wyden and Ranking Member Crapo for inviting me to speak. My name is Robert Burns. I'm a professor of healthcare management and strategy at the Wharton School. One part of my research focuses on the entire healthcare ecosystem. Uh, I've taught the introductory course on the entire healthcare system for over 35 years. Uh, I'm beginning to understand it, so I understand everybody's frustration. Um, I have put it into a textbook, which was published two years ago. It covers not only the life sciences side, pharma and biotech, um, but also the providers, the insurers, uh, both public and private, and then the employers. And it provides a big picture of what goes on in healthcare. And I think you under need to understand that big picture of the ecosystem to understand some of the dynamics that you're focusing on here today. Another part of my research does a deep dive into what we call the supply chain. And I look at both the institutional and the retail supply chains in healthcare. I've written two books on these topics since, and I've been studying them since the 1990s. Uh, this past fall, I published a 650 page book just on the PBMs and the GPOs, uh, basically trying to quote unquote demystify their roles in the healthcare system. Um, to paraphrase uh, Mark Anthony in Act Three of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, I come here today not to praise the PBMs, 
but to bury some concerns about them. And you said you wrote 590 pages about PBMs? And 650 pages on GPOs and that, PBMs. That almost equals, Senator Grassley, the report that you and I did. I think, <laughs> I think we have a close competition. Excuse me for interrupting. It's not going to count against your time. Not at all. Uh, my remarks today focus on three topics. First, just the role of intermediaries. Health intermediaries and healthcare link buyers and sellers. Healthcare is full of them. Uh, they're not well understood or appreciated. There are no courses taught on these critters. Uh, and I liken them to the Rodney Danger field of healthcare. They get absolutely no respect. Worse yet, they're considered the whipping boys. In other words, the people who take the rap and get spanked for the evil doings of others. Um, I've spent 25 years studying these intermediaries, uh, starting with the HMOs in the 90s, the GPOs in the early 2000s, and then more recently, the PBMs. Um, they all take the rap. They're all blamed for all the ills in healthcare. My first book on GPOs and the institutional supply chain taught me a lot about these intermediaries. We've been down this road before, and to quote uh, President Harry Truman, um, uh, the only thing new in the world is the history we don't know, and so that's why I devoted so much time to these things. I believe there's a lot of smoke, but not as much fire as people think. Um, I take my readers through an exercise in critical thinking, looking at the allegations that you've seen everywhere, and then I get my students to ask the question, is what I just heard really true? Uh, a historical analysis, this is one of the tools I use, uh, shows that PBMs serve the interests of health plans and the ERISA plan sponsors who utilize them. The PBMs are agents. They're not rogue actors in the healthcare system. They exert leverage over manufacturers in terms of both the volume, trading off higher volumes for lower unit cost. They've used a lot of the same contracting tools for decades, once you consult the historical record. One thing that should alleviate some concerns here is that their business models have been changing over the last five to 10 years. They no longer rely on rebates the way they used to, and I think that what they're relying on now is the dispensing of specialty pharmaceuticals, and we ought to reserve some time today to talking about the role of specialty pharmaceuticals in the rising prices for Medicare Part D seniors, because it's a huge role. You ought to know that manufacturers don't like intermediaries like PBMs. Very few people like intermediaries like PBMs, and basically that's because they're using leverage to extract price concessions from everybody. The name of the game in this, in this area is trade-offs. You're trading off volume for price, access for price, things like that. You can't have it all, but the PBMs are clearly instruments of trying to uh, extract leverage from the manufacturers. Yes, there has been some consolidation of the PBMs, but it's a competitive market, and if you look carefully, everybody in healthcare is consolidating, not just the PBMs. I think the problem that we face in this sector is no or little competition in the specialty pharmacy area. Uh, the second part of my uh, uh, report focuses on the rebates, or what we call the gross to net disparities. Um, Rebates basically reflect the difference between the gross and the net price. Research shows, if you look carefully, that the rebates do not drive increases in list price. A lot of factors drive that gross to net disparity. A lot of factors drive the rise in the list prices charged by manufacturers. Some of those drivers are found in federal legislation and federal contracting dynamics. Um, second thing to recognize is that those rebates flow uh, increasingly to the health plans who are the uh, people that the PBMs are agents for. They don't flow to the PBMs as much. And I think Part D and Medicaid policies encourage manufacturers to raise their list prices as well as to increase their launch prices, where I think a lot of the attention ought to focus. Uh, finally, there's a lot of issue, issues about rising out-of-pocket costs in Medicare Part D. That occurs primarily in the catastrophic phase, and that's driven primarily by the high cost of specialty pharmaceuticals. We're, we're, we're going to have to move on. I'll right. stop. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, let's see. Uh, Mr. Levin. Chairman Wyden, Ranking Member Crepo. And members of the Senate Finance Committee, thank you for inviting me to testify here today about PBMs. I'm a trial lawyer with the law firm of Friar Levitt. I represent stakeholders in the drug supply chain. But most importantly, independent retail and specialty pharmacies. I've been trying cases against PBMs for the last 20 years. I'm here at my own cost. 
The six largest PBMs control 96% of the nation's prescription drug market and adversely impact all stakeholders in the drug supply chain, including patients, pharmacies, plan sponsors, and taxpayers. As with all Americans, Medicare and Medicaid and employer groups are at the mercy of PBMs and their vertically integrated healthcare conglomerates. These top PBMs are driving independent pharmacies out of business, creating pharmacy deserts, especially in rural areas, fueling drug list prices higher for all Americans, and delaying and denying treatment for the sickest Americans, including those with serious diseases like cancer. In my written testimony, I have provided information on all PBM tactics that adversely impact the stakeholders. During these opening remarks, I address how PBMs fuel drug prices, extract DR fee, DIR fees from pharmacies. While drug manufacturers set drug prices, the growing gap between the list price of drugs and the actual net price is due to rebates that PBMs extract from manufacturers for preferential formula placement and tiering treatment. Americans pay their copay based on the list price of drugs, not the net price. Thus, patients pay dramatically increased artificially inflated costs for drugs. PBMs, through their sister companies, siphon a huge percentage of the list price of drugs as profits to CVS Health, Cigna, and United Health, all of whom own little-known companies called rebate aggregators. Today, two of these PBM-owned rebate aggregators are located outside the United States. Cigna, which owns Express Scripts, owns Ascent Health, located in Switzerland. United Health, which owns OptumRx, also owns MSR, the rebate aggregator, located in Ireland. Just this week, the Attorney General in Ohio filed a lawsuit against Cigna for using, in his own words, a little-known Switzerland-based company to illegally drive up drug prices and ultimately push those higher costs onto patients who rely on life-saving drugs such as insulin. Now, let me make a few comments on DIR fees, the direct and indirect remuneration that PBMs extract from pharmacies. PBMs extracted $12.6 billion in 2021 in post-point-of-sale DIR fees from retail and specialty pharmacies. These performance fees are supposed to be based on legitimate adherence metrics that measure how well a pharmacy has kept a patient on the physician's prescribed drug regimen. However, especially in the case of specialty pharmacies, PBM adherence methodologies are designed to cheat pharmacies and are shrouded in secrecy. Pharmacies are unable to audit PBMs on the accuracy of their DIR fee calculations. PBMs provide no adherence data, and pharmacies are unable to challenge PBMs out of fear of retaliation. CMS will eliminate DIR fees in 2024, but the problem is not eliminated. PBMs and their affiliated Medicare Part D plans will compensate for the lost DIR fee revenue, which is very profitable, by drastically reducing pharmacy reimbursement. Case in point, in 2024, Express Scripts will slash pharmacy reimbursement rates to rates that are worse than the time of when DIR fees existed. The, the other top PBMs are likely to follow, which will drive more pharmacies out of business. However, given that PBMs own their own affiliated mail order pharmacies, the largest specialty pharmacies, and giant chain pharmacies, PBMs don't care if they drive independents out of business. PBMs will make money one way or the other. I have taken depositions of PBM executives and insurance executives, and I have asked questions such as, what do you do with the $12 billion of DIR fees that you take from pharmacies? Does any of it go back to Medicare or to patients? The answers to these questions that I've gotten under oath from these executives are really staggering. I would love to share those answers, but PBM gag clauses and protective orders in these cases prevent me from doing so. I truly hope Congress can shine more transparency on PBMs and pass meaningful legislation for the benefit of all Americans. I welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Levitt. Dr. Gibbs. 
Thank you, Chairman White and Ranking Member, member Crapo and members of the Finance Committee. First and foremost, I'm a pharmacist. I've been in the PBM industry for a very long 24 years, serving in various leadership roles. I'm currently serving as a member of the executive team at Capital Rx, a disruptor PBM in the market. We must first take a step back to truly understand how the PBM situation developed. Since PBMs emerged in the 1980s and 90s, they have played a vital role in the overall supply chain. PBMs connect all pharmacies in the U.S. via a single uniform communication logic. This logic allows pharmacies from single store ownership to multi-store chain operations to communicate safety edits, drug-to-drug -drug interactions, disease-to-drug interactions, and patient payment information. This happens within milliseconds and is arguably the most efficient transaction in all of healthcare. In the early 2000s, PBMs started to grow and scale, while at the same time, brand drug inflation increased. PBMs began to negotiate directly with pharmaceutical manufacturers on rebates for, for, for preferred product placement on the PBM's formularies. Rebates quickly became the lifeblood of every PBM. With this development came a web of complex layers of rebate payment definitions, which became impossible for any employer or government entity to track. The market then shifted in an arguably suspicious direction, cons choosing consolidation over innovation. It is no secret to anyone on this committee that 70 to 80% of the PBM market is controlled by three major organizations. Each of these is either owned by or owns a major insurance carrier. PBMs also own dispensing assets, mail service pharmacies, and specialty home delivery, and in certain circumstances, even a retail chain. Fortunately, the Federal Trade Commission is now examining these market concerns. Most critically is the fact that nearly all PBMs utilize a less than efficient pricing benchmark. This benchmark is known as average wholesale price, or AWP. This was the pricing source that was part of a class action lawsuit that required the majority of publishers of AWP to stop before September 2011. There was hope in the market that at the time a new industry benchmark would emerge. Unfortunately, every PBM migrated back to AWP through another available index, and it now is again the market standard. State fee for service Medicaid plans, however, were no longer going to leverage AWP, so they relied on CMS to develop a new acquisition cost benchmark called National Average Drug Acquisition Cost, or NADAC. It is, a, it is based on survey data from retail pharmacies that report their invoice acquisition costs at the drug level to CMS. NADAC is published on a free public website, while remembering that's the industry standard. different and and social change need a ledger model to describe the problem every day example if you go to the pharmacy to pick up an over-the-counter product, you quickly see the prices in front of you and you know what you're going to pay when you get to the register. But when you go to the back and you go to the pharmacy to pick up your prescription, you spin the roulette wheel and cross your fingers and hope for the most affordable price that month. It doesn't have to be this way. And it is a direct result of the AWP benchmark being manipulated by PBMs. The ask is simple. Every drug should have a price that is accessible to every American at any time. Traditional PBMs have trained everyone to believe that drug pricing is unstable while using complex proprietary algorithms to lower their contractual reimbursements to pharmacies while at the same time not returning those savings to the payers or the patients. And while Medicare limits this practice, practice to some extent, most commercial and managed Medicaid contracts still allow it to continue. One solution is to use NADAC as a publicly available price and the source of truth for drug costs. Is it perfect? No. Is it fundamentally better than the industry standard? Absolutely. I'll leave you with this final message. I've worked my entire career to drive transparency into the pharmacy supply chain. We're at a pivotal moment in history where we can finally change what is broken and bring rational drug level pricing to the American people. Compulsory NADAC reporting from all retail, mail order, and specialty pharmacy home deliveries will, will drive competition and bring meaningful cost insights to payers and patients alike. Thank you, Chairman Wyden, Ranking Member Crapo, and the committee for your time on this crucial issue. All right. Colleagues and guests, um, we're about to start votes. Two points. One, we're just going to keep this moving. It is such an important topic, and Senator Crapo and I will figure out a way to do it. The first four questioners will still be the first 
four questioners, though, in a somewhat different order because Senator Stabenow is going to get to a forestry okay. hearing, and she's been very patient and has a great interest. Senator Stabenow. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, and thank you to all of you. This is a really important hearing, and I, I very much appreciate your courtesy as well. Um, I have long been involved in the issues around rising prices of prescription drugs, as many of our colleagues have, and I mean, this is bottom line about life-saving medicine. It's about people's life and their health, uh, I, and I would say it's hard to find something more serious than whether or not people can afford the medicine that they need. And unfortunately, we know that for decades, Americans have been paying the highest prices in the world, <laughs> and which makes no sense. And um, when, when we look at three times as, uh, three times higher as many in, in many countries, I mean, it's just, it, it makes absolutely no sense. One of the life-saving drugs we've tried to tackle, and we are tackling, is insulin. And we know that prices have tripled in the last decade with insulin costs uh, going up 800% more than other developed countries. So we've now put a cap on of $35 uh, per month for someone on Medicare for insulin. Good start. The drug companies that uh, make insulin are now uh, appearing to move in this direction, but there is a lot more to do, Medicare negotiations and so on. My Know the Lowest Price Act, which was signed into law in 2018, banned PBMs from blocking pharmacists from telling patients how they could pay less, less money for a prescription if they paid out of pocket. They weren't allowed to tell people that. Uh, so that was just one of uh, many, many bad practices. So let me get to today. Um, PBMs have said that their purpose is to negotiate lower prices. I said when we had a group of PBMs in front of us a couple of years ago, we should call them PBNs because they're pretty bad negotiators if that's what they're supposed to be doing. So I would uh, first uh, ask Ms. Feldman, um, can you discuss in more detail the PBM's practices that have led Americans to pay the highest prices in the world. Thank you. When PBMs channel patients into higher priced drugs, then the prices rise for everyone in the system. Fair and efficient markets don't work that way. Patients should be encouraged to buy the drug with a lower sticker price. That entire system is how we end up with some of the highest prices in the world for the same drugs that other developed countries are purchasing. Thank you very much. And Mr. Lovett, you talked about the DIR fees, which I share your great concern about both for uh, those independent uh, pharmacies and so on, but um, also for beneficiaries. And so um, when could you talk more about how the DIR fees harm the sickest people in the system? And could you give us more detail? I mean, we're talking about people who have cancer, or other serious diseases, and how they are affected by these fees. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, it is true that the sickest are the most harmed because I will say PBMs uh, have made the argument that when we collect all these uh, rebates and also uh, fees from pharmacies, we're able to lower the premium. And that is actually true. Uh, that the premium is lowered for those who, and for those who never use their prescription drug card, they paid a lower premium. But for the sickest Americans, those with, for example, with cancer, when they go to the pharmacy counter, as has been stated, they pay, they, they pay the maximum copay, they go into the donut hole, and then they go into catastrophic coverage. All of them, anyone who's on a specialty drug. And so those patients who use their medication, they, they pay the most. And also, the government does. In the catastrophic coverage phase, the PBM insurance company pay the le least, manufacturers and the government pay more, and so do patients. So the sickest patients are the biggest losers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you again, uh, Ranking Member, for holding this hearing. This is a very important piece of how we're going to really make medicine in America 
affordable for people. And I would just add, we as taxpayers pay for basic research that creates these drugs, which I'm happy to do. And it, this is an important piece of what happens, but it's public dollars. And then when we end up paying the highest prices in the world, this does not equate. This, this doesn't work. And I'm so glad we're tackling this. And thanks for all your leadership on these issues, Senator Stabenow. I hope everybody picked up on the point Mr. Levitt just made to Senator Stabenow, and that is you can do phenomenally well in the prescription drug system as long as you never need medicines. If you don't need medicines, everything works out well. Senator Crapo. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. When we talk about the need for greater transparency in the drug supply chain, uh, that term can and should mean a few different things. It means transparency for plans who need to select the best PBM option and conduct effective oversight. But it also means transparency for consumers in choosing a plan, as well as for providers in choosing the most cost-effective, clinically appropriate medication to, to prescribe. We also know from experience that any effective transparency policy needs to drive down rather than increase costs and that credible trade secrets warrant protection. With these considerations in mind, uh, start with you, uh, Mr. Levitt and Dr. Van Nuys, in that order. What specific and concrete policy steps should we take to improve transparency under the Medicare Part D system for patients and plan sponsors as well as for providers and pharmacies? And I'd ask you to be as succinctly as, succinct as you can because I want to have a few other answers as well. So uh, to, to speak very succinctly, um, I think the, the uh, process to, for the government to take that would be the most practical and the most effective would be to create a rebate safe, a true rebate safe harbor. So that would mean that it would be transparent, that PBMs could legally take a rebate fee or administrative fee, but it would be limited 3%, 4%, 5%, not 50%. So I think a very practical rebate safe harbor would be a big change. Uh, Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Were you going to add something? I was just going to add, for, for the, from the patient perspective, the Medicare plan finder is where patients go to look and see their copay. The Medicare plan finder doesn't reveal that patients are paying a copay based on that list price of the drug instead of the net price after rebates and after DIR fees. All right, thank you. And Dr. Van Nuys. Thank you, yes. You heard from Dr. Gibbs in his opening statement about how helpful the national average drug acquisition co cost data are to his business model, but it's also helpful to researchers like us. I think one action that the federal government could take is to create similar pricing series that are collected regularly, standardized, averaged, and posted publicly, just like NADAC is, um, would help, but those series not on the acquisition cost, which is the cost that pharmacies pay from to wholesalers, but at other points in the distribution system. So, for example, the prices that or the reimbursements that pharmacies are receiving from pharmacy benefit managers, or the prices that health plans are paying their pharmacy benefit managers to settle claims. If we had similar aggregated, so not, not disclosing any, any you know, confidential information, if we had similar consistent benchmarks and measures in those points of the distribution system, people like Dr. Gibbs could use them in their business negotiations. Researchers like me and regulators could know more about how, this, how prices are moving throughout the system. I think that would be a big help. All right, thank you very much. And Dr. Gibbs, what would your answer to that question be? Well, I, f I feel as if Dr. Van Nuys quoted me, uh, but, <laughs> but uh, I, I would say it's, it's very similar. You know, we're using a pricing index everywhere, Medicare, managed Medicaid, commercial, off of AWP, and it literally has nothing to do with the price of a drug. So I don't, I don't know if people understand that most, if not all, Medicare contracts, you pay the average cost of all drugs, that's your guarantee. Not, drugs don't have a price. You don't know the price of generic Lipitor. You pay a price based on all generics average over a year. We don't buy any products like that in our economy. We have accepted it in the drug business, and until we get rid of that fundamental issue of these average mix marks that are not related to drug costs, we can do all these other great creative things around rebates, transparency, but when the cost basis is not reflective of actual cost, it, it's, it's not going to be worth it. We have to change that. 
Well, thank you very much. I have a number of other questions that basically ask for solutions. And I'm not going to have time to get into those, so I'm going to yield my time back now to the chairman. But I would like to ask you all, I'll tell you, we will be submitting questions for the record to you. And I ask you to really pay a lot of attention to these questions because we need the kind of expertise guidance that you can give to us to help us put together the right solutions here. And I, I second uh, Senator Crapo's request. We want to make this a bipartisan effort in this committee, so please treat Senator Crapo's questions just like mine and everyone else's. We've, we've got to get moving on this. My first question to you, uh, Dr. Feldman, is in 2021, <coughs> Senator Grassley and I released what was really a landmark report reviewing contracts between the three biggest PBMs and insulin manufacturers. One of the findings was that the manufacturers often pay PBMs administrative fees for services, for example, for providing data. And PBMs make billions of dollars every year off these fees. The report also found that these administrative fees are often based on a drug's list price. So preferring a higher drug uh, price drug by placing it on an advantageous lower formulary tier can make more money for the PBM, yet higher costs for patients and taxpayers. Question, doesn't the PBM's practice of preferring higher priced drugs raise patient costs and overall drug spending? <clears throat> yes, of course. When patients are channeled into higher priced drugs, the prices rise. The system you've just described the problem is that the person negotiating on behalf of the patient shouldn't be getting paid by the other side. It's a conflict of interest, it's a problem, and it pushes those prices higher. When that payment is based on a higher price of the drug, it undermines the negotiation entirely. You're being way too logical <clears throat> for a lot of the way the federal government does business, and I appreciate it. Dr. Van Nuys, for you, your research suggests that PBMs may be overcharging their health plan clients for generic medicines, including Medicare Part D plans. <clears throat> One of your studies found that Medicare was overcharged by $2.6 billion for generic medicines in 2018 alone compared to Costco's pricing for the same drugs. A separate Harvard study backs up your findings. They found Medicare would have saved $3 billion in 2020 if Part D plans were charged the same prices that Mark Cuban's cost plus, plus drug company charges for generics. This is all factually correct thus far. Is that correct? Yes. OK. Now, it's no secret that big PBMs can be effective negotiators when there's competition between drug manufacturers. It's hard to believe they aren't getting as good a deal, if not better, than Costco or Mark Cuban. So I want to finish up with a specific example. Civica Script is a nonprofit pharmaceutical manufacturer. They sell a generic prostate cancer drug for $160. The average price that the PBMs are charging the Part D plans for the exact same drug is over $3,000. Just let that all sink in a little bit. Difference between the uh, generic prostate cancer drug for 160 bucks, <clears throat> PBMs charging Part D $3,000. Yet Civica can't get the big three PBMs to cover their drug, which is a tiny fraction of what they're doing their business with. So as a result, Part D plans and consequently patients and taxpayers for this drug, this specific drug, in this specific case, they're facing a markup of nearly 2,000%. Is that right? The math? Yeah. Oh, uh, I trust your math. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> correct. <laughs> so, um, colleagues, we're going to enter this letter into the record from Civica Script. It provides more details on the issue. But the example that we have cited with the generic prostate cancer drug we are talking about a markup of almost 2,000%. So something's way out of whack here. All right. Uh, one last question for you, uh, Dr. Van Nuys. Why do PBMs appear to be charging such high prices to do their health plan clients, to their health plan clients for these medicines? I think the short answer is because they can. 
um, lack of transparency in these markets allows PBMs to pay the pharmacy one reimbursement and then charge the plan for that same prescription a different price and keep the difference, which is the spread. And because plans cannot see what the pharmacy has been paid, they don't know when they're being overcharged. And it is that kind of lack of transparency that certainly is driving what happened with the Costco study that we did. I suspect that is also going on in the Civica RX example you just cited. In the Civica RX example, there's also this added complexity of the PBM owning the specialty pharmacy that's dispensing it. That's a different issue, but also related to your question. So let me close with this, and my time is just about up. Uh, this sounds like a really bad news discussion for patient costs and, uh, and spending under Medicare. Is that your assessment as well? Yes, I agree. Because we've got to figure out how to hold down costs in America. We've got to figure out how to strengthen Medicare. Senator Crapo and I talk about this often. In this committee, colleagues, uh, the late Senator Hatch worked with us. I think uh, Senator Grassley remembers as well. We built the chronic care bill. We're interested in finding ways for people to get good quality care and to make it more affordable. We have just gotten a snapshot in time of just how the consumer gets fleeced under these kinds of PBM uh, practices and how that really ripples right through to uh, Medicare, which picks up so many of these uh, bills, and we just can't afford to do business uh, this way uh, and meet the challenge of Medicare and our time. Senator Grassley. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, thank you for continuing this committee's work on, I, on PBMs. Uh, something ought to get done this Congress considering the fact that there's already a bill out of judiciary, a bill out of commerce. Uh, Senator Sanders is talking about getting a bill out of the help committee. Uh, the House committee is already uh, working on this issue. I believe it's our duty to understand how the pharmaceutical supply chain is working and what we can do to improve it. In 2019, this committee held a hearing with PBM executives and we worked to advance a bipartisan bill uh, to shed more light on PBMs and uh, drug companies. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act took uh, big steps to reduce drug prices, but there are approximately 30 provisions in the grassley Wyden still not law that would establish more accountability in the drug pricing world, including PBMs. The current drug supply system is so opaque that it's easy to see why there are many questions about PBM motives and practices. In 2018, I pressed the Federal Trade Commission to investigate PBMs. Uh, last year, the FTC began studying PBMs, and I'm not waiting, uh, we can't wait for FTC to issue their report. The Judiciary and Commerce Committee have passed PBM bills that I'm working on with Senator Cantwell. Senator Cantwell is also on this committee. The prescription drug pricing, uh, pricing for the people's bill requires the FTC to study pharmaceutical intermediaries, including vertical integration, and issue a report and recommendations to Congress within one year. This bill has uh, passed the Judiciary Committee on a voice vote. The PBM Transparency Act has advanced out of the Commerce Committee a bipartisan vote of 18 to 9. Uh, this bill puts sunshine on PBMs and saved taxpayers $740 billion. Million. I pursued bipartisan legislation, held hearings, and conducted oversight. In the grassley Wyden two-year investigation into insulin price gouging, we found that the PBM scheme encourages drug makers to spike the drug list price in order to offer greater rebates and in turn secure priority placement on covered meds uh, and all at the expense of many patients. This especially impacts individuals who are uninsured, underinsured, and on high deductible plans. Recently, three insulin manufacturers encouraged, uh, announced that they were lowering list price on their insulin products. I believe a key way that we can solve high 
prescription drug prices uh, is to uh, have more transparency. And those on the panel, one on the panel raised a price about it being scapegoat. I think uh, they've created their own scapegoat uh, environment because the lack of transparency. If you want people to understand what you're doing and you're playing a very important role uh, in this whole business of getting pills from manufacturer to the consumer, then uh, why not uh, have uh, transparency and then you don't have any problems with public not understanding what you're doing. So my one and only question will be to Ms. Van Nuys and Mr. Levitt, the Cantwell Grassley PBM Transparency Act requires transparency reporting to shine sunlight on prices and fees. Why is PBM transparency important to ensuring taxpayers and patients are getting the lowest drug prices possible? I think transparency is an essential first step because it gives researchers like me, regulators like the federal government, um, the opportunity to understand the bigger picture. Um, but more importantly, that kind of transparency is actually going to provide participants in the markets with information about the true prices that they're facing. And when they have information about the true prices that they're facing, they can make better economic decisions and they can choose the highest value opportunity. So um, I think it's an, an important first step. I think it will help in at least those two ways. Mr. Levitt. Thank you. Uh, it, it is our contention, based on information we've seen in litigation um, and, and how we studied the market, that there's a huge percentage of the list price of drug that is retained by the PBM and the PBM rebate aggregator. Transparency would shine the light on that. It's okay if PBMs make some money, but if it's 20 or 30 percent of the list price of a drug, that's a problem. And if we're able to shine that transparency on those rebates, uh, we can actually lower the list price of drugs for all Americans. Pharmaceutical companies could literally charge less and earn the same net price. Plan sponsors, including the government, Medicare and Medicaid, and private employers could pay, the same, could pay a lower price for drugs, and pharmacies could stay in business because they could get a reasonable reimbursement rate. I thank my colleague, and next is, um, is Senator Cornyn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is an extraordinary panel, and um, there's uh, so much complexity here that um, I'm going to join Senator Crapo in, in sending you some specific questions about solutions. Uh, I'm not sure what the right metaphor is. Um, I've heard you talk about the system being riddled with perverse incentives. Um, sometimes the PBM is called a black box, and I've heard us talk about transparency. I start with the fundamental proposition that our pharmaceutical industry um, is in, entitled uh, to a return on their investment and their risk taking, and that we are the beneficiary of that from a public health standpoint. The fact that uh, the American and the international pharmaceutical industry could come up with Operation Warp Speed in an in a incredible amount of time, save millions of lives, is something to be uh, celebrated. Conversely, um, I do believe that there's a lot of gamesmanship going on in the industry. Maybe that's an understatement for all of you here. So again, I don't know what the right metaphor is, whether it's a Rubik's Cube or a shell game or what, it, what you want to call it, but Transparency, as many of you have said, uh, seems to be um, an important part of getting the right answer. But I can't help but feel like this is by design, the complexity and uh, the difficulty of actually determining what is the price of the drug. Uh, Dr. Gibbs, you talked about the importance of setting that, that standard. Um, so I am very interested in, um, in getting some specific proposals, and of course, Senator Grassley and others have talked about transparency. But it strikes me that without transparency, the market can't work. Dr. Van Nuys, do you agree with that? Wholeheartedly, yes. 
I mean, I'm, I'm not an economist. Uh, I'm a recovering lawyer. Uh, but it seems to me that this, this whole area is rife with gamesmanship. We've even had examples of, of drugs um, that uh, have had as many as 100 different patents, uh, so-called patent thickets and product hopping and other gamesmanship by the industry to try to maximize price. Again, I don't begrudge uh, the industry making a return on their investment, and I know it's highly risky, but I do object to the gamesmanship and the playing a rigged system. So, Dr. Van Nuys, why, why is it that Costco can charge so much less for the same drug? Again, I'm gonna go back to transparency. Um, I think that um, because uh, in a cash market, there's no third party payer, um, there's no spread. Uh, the PBM is not charging a spread. And uh, so Costco doesn't have to pass those costs on um, to the, to the uh, patient. I'm not, I usually don't uh, gamble when I go to Las Vegas, but sometimes they talk about the spread. Uh, this sounds like it's uh, one big um, gambling operation. I'm not sure whether it's gambling, but it is a way for PBMs to capture money inside that distribution process, yes. And Dr. Gibbs, you talked about the, the mechanism that you have used to, and, um, to try to make provide more transparency and sort of a standard price that people can operate from because we lack the basic information to understand the system and this whole, Mr. Levitt's talked about all the uh, uh, do not disclose statements and the confidential settlements and things like that that prohibit him from telling us what he knows about this system. But what impact do you think um, your company and the way you're operating in terms of the business model what, uh, compared to Amazon or Mark Cuban's uh, cost plus drugs, what, what promise does that um, have to lead us out of this uh, this terrible mess. Sure. I, I, thank you, Senator, for your question. I, I would say our goal is and always has been to bring transparency options regardless of channel. So you want to make health. money too, though, don't you? Correct. I mean, we are, we're a startup. We started in 2018, and we're not profitable yet. We're getting there. And it's, I don't think Amazon was either for the first exactly. uh, <laughs> period exactly. of time. Exactly. And using a price index like NADAC, which is published by CMS, they actually do the survey to the pharmacies. And by making it more robust so it's not voluntary, today it's a voluntary survey, and getting better responses to that will lead us to the actual drug cost. And then you can have your, your nuance of Costco, Mark Cuban, and a, a person can actually go in and look and actually be informed about the real prices once and for all. Today, with all the dynamics from PBM spread to stores having different usual and customary fees to membership programs that all the stores have, it has created this quagmire for a person to really know what they're going to pay. The only way is the level set. The good news is we have the tools already. We just need to enforce them. Well, Dr. Burns, I appreciate your scholarly work, but the fact that it took you 650 pages or so to explain PBMs and GPOs, I think speaks volumes about uh, where we are. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Senator, Senator Cornyn. Next would be Senator Cardin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and let me thank you for uh, calling this hearing. I want to thank our panelists. Uh, put me down on the uh, comments that you made in the opening. Uh, I strongly support greater transparency. The rebate system seems to be leading to the wrong types of incentives. Higher cost drugs are priority over lower cost drugs. And quite frankly, I don't know who holds the pharmaceutical benefit managers accountable for any public responsibility. And I think that's the challenge. We taxpayers are the largest payers and consumers of pharmaceutical products, and yet the pharmaceutical benefit managers that play a critical role in this are really not accountable to us. And to me, that's the major challenge. So. I don't know how we get a handle on the accountability issue, but let me mention one area that's been one of my major uh, areas of concern. We have many low-cost drugs that are very important in our healthcare system, infusion drugs that are in short supply. 
I have heard specifically of examples where patients were denied the protocol care because the drugs were not available. And these are low-cost drugs that in the richest country in the world that spends the most on pharmaceutical products, to me, it is outrageous that these drugs are not in adequate supply. Now, you would think the pharmaceutical benefit managers that are negotiating on behalf of companies' coverage for prescription for drugs would have leverage to make sure that low-cost drugs are available. But it does not seem to be the case. And this past year, we added more drugs to the, the uh, shortage of supply list uh, than we ever have in the past. So how can we modify our system to make sure that we have adequate supplies? And how can the pharmaceutical benefit managers be engaged in that process? Who wants to take a shot at that? Please. Well, there are federal reports that the major problem with drug shortages is not the PBMs, it's with the manufacturers. And I'm not here today to bash the manufacturers, but oftentimes those shortages are driven by manufacturing problems and compliance problems in the plants operated by those manufacturers. That's source of the problem number one. Source of the problem number two is sometimes we just don't have enough manufacturers there such that one could pick up the slack if one of the other manufacturers' production goes down. I, I agree with you that the primary responsibility is with drug manufacturers and their profit motives, and if they can't make enough on a particular drug, they're going to use the capacity for other purposes. But I would just argue that pharmaceutical benefit managers are a huge part of the pharmaceutical chain here, and they could use their leverage in regards to pharmaceutical manufacturers. I would suggest also that the group purchasing organizations they're setting up could also add to the number of drug shortages because of the pricing here. So there is part of what they are setting up, to me, that makes the problem more challenging. Yes, do you want to respond? Yes. Levin. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I think that uh, it's true manufacturers should be making these short supply drugs, but I think one of the things that PBMs can do in a more moral control of the formulary is to put these low-cost drugs uh, on the formulary, encourage manufacturers uh, to, to make these by giving them a, a fair return and giving the pharmacies a fair return for dispensing some of these drugs. I agree. I mean, I, it, it seems to me that, as I see it, the PBMs have ignored this issue and in some cases have made it worse because of the way that they've organized their pricing. So it encourages the pharmaceutical, manuf uh, the pharmaceutical manufacturers to do what they're doing today rather than trying to provide a different avenue so that we can deal with the shortages. We have some legislation here that deal with this, the shelf life of uh, drugs to, to make it easier and some incentives to have, add capacity for lower drug manu uh, cost manufacturing. So we, we're doing some things we're on the supply side, but when you look at the profits that are being made, both at the manufacturer level and at the benefit manager level, to me it's shocking that there is not an attention to the patient who needs these drugs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank uh, my colleague. Senator Cassidy is next. Dr. Burns, like no one's talking to you, man. So uh, I would like to talk to you. Uh, we've got several academics on, and if you read Ms. Feldman and Dr. Van Nuys's, you're thinking, are y'all from the same planet, right? You, you seem to, to be, so let me just ask some things that Dr. Nyes puts in her testimony and have your response. Um, in 2019, before patents were due to expire, Gilead introduced authorized generic versions of Harvani uh, that was going to lower out-of-pocket costs by $2,500 but it never made it to several PBMs formulary. And the patients continued to pay top dollar, uh, even though there was a generic that was available. I think I summarized that correct, Dr. Nice. Uh, now that would look like something which is an abuse of a PBM, by a PBM. What would you say to that, Dr. Burns? Well, one has to look at the incentives in Medicare Part D plans. Um, 
and the incentives there are to get the uh, beneficiary through all of the uh, various coverage phases into the catastrophic phase where the government picks up almost all of the tab and the health plan pays very little. So it's the health plans who have an incentive for the patients to move through those uh, coverage plans such that their liability is diminished when the patient hits the uh, catastrophic phase. It's not the PBM, it's the health plan that the PBM is an agent for. So the, you're saying that the health plan would be instructing the Part D PBM in order to put that formulary so as to move the person into the catastrophic phase most rapidly? Well, the health plans run the Part D plans. They're not instructing the PBM to run the patient. So it still sounds like a little bit of a collusion. If you've got an insurance company that is owning, that owns and holds the PBM company, and they're telling them, listen, we want to offload our responsibility, so stick it to the patient buying the drug to move them into, that's what you're saying, huh? Not necessarily, because that vertical integration that you've talked about with the health plans owning the PBMs, it's mostly recent. Okay, the up until 2018, the only health plan that owned a PBM. Yeah, but I think what we're describing is still a recent phenomenon, at least until that was capped. Uh, Mr. Levitt, you're, you're shaking your head, you're waving your hand, you're like jumping up and down, but be concise. I thought I was being more subtle than that, but um, yeah, I mean, the, the PBMs and the insurance companies are one and the same, and there, there's no firewall. So United Health owns Optum. Uh, Cigna owns Express Scripts, and CVS owns Caremark, uh, and, and Aetna and Silver Scripts. So to the extent, that was an accurate statement. These, these health plans, they want the patient to have a higher cost drug to move through the coverage phases to get to the... So what I think what you're saying is that we have to actually broaden our view. The PBM is merely an agent for the insurance company that is willing to foist cost upon both the consumer and upon the federal taxpayer in order to maximize their profit. That's right, but... Now, I, let me stop because i got yeah. limited time. Uh, Dr. Van Nuys, um, now, uh, recent legislation has capped the... has changed the dynamic of the Medicare Part D uh, incentive. Theoretically, there's no, longer the ins there's no longer a reward for sticking it to the patient and moving her into the catastrophic. Uh, would you expect that which Dr. Burns is... Yeah. I think it's fair to say, I don't know if it's minimizing is the right word, but it seems to give less importance to. Uh, how do you think this is going to impact it? I'll start by saying I'm not sure, we'll um, but I do think that it could um, alleviate some of the issue. I don't know. We will have to see how it plays out to understand. And, and Mr. Burns, coming back, Dr. Burns, going back to you, um, I think you're quoting Weinstein Schulman's uh, data when you, in your testimony, say that people are inferring that the higher list price, even though net price is minimally rising, um, that they are inferring that that's related to the fees, the rebates, et cetera. Seems like a pretty good inference to me. Um, and so, and knowing that that high list price is what the person, the patient and her deductible is going to pay, like Menendez is next. they're still extracting more money from the Medicare beneficiary, a, a lot more money. Uh, your thoughts on that? Sure. Um, research, as well as my own uh, study of some of these drugs, shows that the list price goes up because the manufacturers can get away with it. Now, now the Schulman article, or articles, and Schulman Weinstein most recently, uh, shows that the list price grows, I don't know, 2.7%, whereas the, uh, I'm sorry, list price will grow 5%, and the net price is growing 1.7%. Now, that is not the manufacturer. In fact, there's a depressive effect. Others have, known, have noted that this is costing manufacturers a fair amount of money. So I'm not sure, so where would you come from? Well, the manufacturer is setting that list price, and then the PBMs act as agents on the health plan. No, that, no, that list price that is list. a negotiation between the rebate and the net price. In fact, I think I know that the manufacturers do not report uh, as a profit the list price, they only report the net price, which tells me that that's all they're counting on, and the rebate, the price between the list and the net is that which the PBM is demanding for, for, for where they put it on a tier, et cetera. Would you dispute that? Well, the PBM demands that in order to get on the formulary and then demands a bigger rebate in order to get a more favored position on that formulary. And then the PBM 
translates or passes along those rebates to the health plan. It's the issue is what the health plans do with that money, not the PBMs. I am way over, but I will say that the lack of the, the opaqueness of it is I think what people are concerned about because we don't know the entirety of that is going back to the payor. It may be going back to the in integrated insurance company, but we don't know it's going back to Google, Exxon, Deloitte and Touche or, uh, you know, performance contracting in Louisiana. To, to be, what I would to say be continued, uh, Senator Cassidy, important point. Senator Menendez is next, followed by Senator Carper and Senator Thin. Uh, Mr. Levitt, uh, pharmacy benefit managers are key players, or should be, in alleviating patients' financial burden at the pharmacy counter as they frequently set patient out-of-pocket costs based on a drug list price. The higher the list price, the more the patient pays, an obvious burden. Less obvious but equally concerning is that PBMs benefit significantly from high list prices and have no incentive to choose lower priced drugs to drive down patient costs. PBMs extract rebates from manufacturers based on list price in exchange for a manufacturer's drug receiving formulary placement. Those rebates are passed on to plans and employers but almost never to patients. And manufacturers also pay distributors, group purchasing organizations, and specialty pharmacies percentage fees that are based on the list price. The patient gets nothing. So under the current structure, PBMs make more money when a drug's list price increases while patients bear the financial burden. Conversely, if a manufacturer lowers the list price, PBMs stand to lose money while patients benefit. So, Mr. Levitt, do you agree that it would be better for patients if the supply chain was delinked from list prices so that patient out-of-pocket costs were based on net prices? Yeah, there's absolutely no doubt that patients would, would do better paying a copay based on that lower price, based on uh, this, the drug benefit structure of, of almost all plans. And let me ask you, would, would patients be better off if PBMs and other supply chain entities were paid flat fees for the services they provide? A absolutely, they would, now, as long as it was a reasonable flat fee. Now, Umera uh, treats people who are afflicted with crippling rheumatoid arthritis. This critical medicine can cost patients more than $80,000 a year. It should be good news to consumers that Umera biosimilars are being launched, which should make the treatment more affordable for patients who desperately need it. But because the economic incentives to PBMs are completely skewed, the biosimilar drug launched with two different prices, one with a high list price and large rebate, one with a low list price and lower rebate. So take another look at this chart. We know PBMs favor the high list price in order to obtain larger rebates, even though the patient would pay significantly less if PBM selected the drug with the lower list price. So is it true, Mr. Levitt, that the current structure incentivizes P PBMs to select higher cost drugs to the detriment of patients? Yes, Senator, it does. And, and it's often to the detriment of, of the patient because sometimes there's a better drug on formulary that, uh, that is, doesn't pay as much of a rebate that would be better for the patient. You know, the Pharmacy Care Management Association, which represents the PBMs, includes research on their website that states, and I quote, High list prices hurt patients who must pay these prices. If list prices were lower, out-of-pocket payments based on list prices would be lower and more affordable. It rocked my mind when I read this. So if the PBM themselves acknowledge lower list prices would help patients at the pharmacy counter, why would they still place preference on a higher list price product when a drug company has given them a better option for their patients? because they have established uh, this architecture in the system where they have these rebate aggregators that we believe are secretly siphoning a lot of that, that rebate out and not giving it back to the plan or the consumer. Thank you. Now, finally, as a result of mergers and acquisitions in recent years, CVS Caremark, Express Scripts, uh, Optum RX uh, now control approximately 80% 80 of all U.S. prescription drug claims. This level of concentration gives these PBMs market power over data, drug coverage, and contracting. 80%. The hyper-consolidation with little to no regulatory oversight 
creates inappropriate negotiating leverage that discourages competition and makes it difficult to achieve transparency, affordability, and timely access for patients. So, Mr. Levin, how does the consolidation in the PBM market impact costs for patients? And what sort of regulation and oversight is needed to protect consumers? I, th I think, first of all, the, the, um, there's massive power influence over physicians, uh, which is a problem. We want physicians to, to act independently. Um, I think what th some of the things Congress could do uh, to lower drug price would be to create uh, more transparency, as has been discussed a lot, but also a, a safe harbor for rebates. If PB PBMs want to earn a rebate um, and keep money, it should be a, an amount defined by the government. I think that would help lower drug prices. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I, I appreciate Mr. Levitz from New Jersey, his sock wear. I, we, uh, I, no, I uh, noticed. Looks like he may have graduated from North Carolina uh, at one point. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next will be Senator Carper and Senator Thune, and I thank my colleagues for their patience. And when we start voting, we're going to keep everything going. Senator Carper. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, everyone. Nice to uh, see you all. Um, I, uh, I'm from Delaware, born in West Virginia, grew up in West Virginia, but uh, uh, privileged to represent the people of Delaware here for, for quite a while now, be their governor and, and all. I, um, uh, we're proud in Delaware, especially for being the first state to uh, ratify the Constitution. And in the Constitution, may recall, in the preamble of the Constitution, it starts with these words, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. It doesn't say in order to form a perfect union, a more perfect union. And out of that, I, I take the idea that everything we do, we can do better. And we need to do better. And that includes the, the way we deliver health care to cover more people, do it in cost-effective uh, ways, harness market forces where we can to provide uh, better, better health care. I like to say there are four questions that I ask when I'm considering, among other things, uh, uh, how to make pharmaceuticals more available to, uh, to people who make sure that they're getting the, the drugs that they need at, at a reasonable cost. But I, I ask four questions. Uh, in this realm, and one of those is, what is the, I'm given an idea, I say, what is the uh, effect on uh, patients? How does it affect patients? Mom, I ask, how will this affect uh, taxpayers? What will, what's the budget implications of what's suggested to us? The third uh, question I ask is, uh, is a, a particular answer uh, or ask, uh, idea, does it foster innovation? Does it diminish innovation? And the, the last, uh, the last uh, question I, I ask is, does a particular idea uh, simplify or make more complex an already complex uh, situation, as you know? And uh, with that in mind, I'm going to ask, not a question for all of you, I'm going to pick on Dr. Karen Van Nuys. And uh, uh, I, uh, uh, I, I appreciate your, your response to this. Uh, one of, uh, again, one of my guiding principles, as I just mentioned, is uh, the first one, of what is uh, in terms of pharm pharmaceuticals and uh, the work that, uh, that we do here with respect to prescription drugs, uh, one of my uh, first questions is how does it affect patients at the counter in terms of their pocketbooks? Uh, and that's why I, I previously co-sponsored something called uh, Creating Transparency to Have Drug Rebates Unlocked, and you bet there's a, an acronym for all that. And it's uh, C, capital C, uh, through THRU, led, and it's led by uh, Senator uh, Wyden, uh, which uh, would have uh, ensured that cost savings from rebates provided uh, by drug manufacturers would be passed on to patients. Uh, at the same time, sometimes lowering costs that in one uh, part of our healthcare market, as you know, can cause another, so it's like a squeeze in a balloon, it pops out some someplace else. But here's my question, Dr. Van uh, Nice. Can you share with us briefly your thoughts on how we can better ensure that rebate cost savings are passed down to patients at the, at, at the, at the counter, uh, while also uh, managing uh, costs for our federal government? And is there a narrow or maybe an incremental way to go about this so we can balance these uh, trade-offs? Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, Let's see. Uh, as you note, it is hard to lower patient out-of-pocket costs without impacting premiums and squeezing the balloon in one place and having it bulge in another. And so one of the solutions or, or, or an avenue to help um, would be to take some of the savings that we have identified, right, the $2.6 billion that Medicare was overpaying for low-cost generic drugs in 2018, and figure out ways to take that money out of the current system 
and get it to patients for out-of-pocket relief, or we can lower premiums. We can do a lot of things with that. We had a, my uh, co-author, Aaron Trish, and I had um, an op-ed in the Washington Post this week about taking those low-cost generic drugs out of the, the benefit so that we don't run it through this process that adds 21% to their costs. Mm -hmm. Right now, that 21% is going to intermediaries. There are much better things we can be doing with that money, helping patients, helping taxpayers, helping the domestic supply industry, um, and helping innovation. That's a very good answer. Yes, oh yeah, go ahead and, and then I'll, uh, my time will expire, but go ahead, please. I think there are three key areas that would be worth focusing on yes, to try to bring sanity here. One is to clarify that the PBMs have a duty to the health plans and the patients they represent. The second is to ensure transparency so the market can operate, price and price term transparency. And the third is to ensure that patients get the benefit when they choose a cost-effective drug, so that when the drug has a lower sticker price and the patient chooses it, the patient pays less. Great. I'm going to ask the, the, uh, the men, I have to go. Ms. I've got some men on the panel. If you agree with what she just said, there was three. Raise your right hand. Uh, if you agree with two of them, raise your right hand. <laughs> How about one? All right, we'll come back and we'll let the guys have their chant time later on. Thank you. Thanks th very much. Th thank you, Senator Carper. Senator Thune. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would say if, if we were starting over, I would blow up this whole model, uh, the supply chain, because I think it is an antiquated model. And I believe the free market works when there's competition. But you've got so much vertical in integration, so much consolidation of market power, and, 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 and no transparency has been pointed out a lot of times already. And um, I just, th this to me makes no sense. And, and I've tried to study this, uh, this supply chain and how this uh, drug pricing works in this country. Um, and I just, it, it is incredibly complex. There isn't any other thing, product that we buy um, in the market that has such a complicated and antiquated um, way of, of getting products to the consumer. Um, I, I want to, I say that as just an observation and something that I hope we can work on, but I know that these, uh, some of these issues are embedded in, in a system that's been in place for a long time, but I, I would start over. Uh, let me start. I've got a question having to do with the 340B program, which is critical to South Dakota hospitals, and Mr. Levitt, if you could speak to this. I often hear concerns from South Dakota pharmacists, hospitals, and health centers when it comes to engaging with PBMs, especially on the 340B program. The dy dynamics of 340B are complicated as well. There's a lot going on with uh, contract pharmacies right now, but it's important that the program continues to serve its intended purpose of helping our hospitals and health centers support their communities. So could you talk about the impact of PBM's practices on hospitals and health centers in the 340B program? Thank you, Senator. I think nowhere in the drug supply chain is the influence of vertically integrated healthcare companies with PBMs and what they call third-party administrators in the 340B program uh, more troubling. The whole idea of 340B is to get 50% of the drug cost um, as a profit back to the, the hospitals like the ones in South Dakota. But what, what really happens? You have PBMs that take maybe a DIR fee of 5% or 10%. So that 50% profit that's supposed to go to hospitals in your state is taken by PBMs. PBMs also own a third-party company that manages a 340B program those third-party companies might take out another 10%. So now that 50% profit that was supposed to help the indigent care in South Dakota, 15% is gone. Then you have the PBMs that own pharmacies and specialty pharmacies, and they act as contract pharmacies, as you mentioned, for the covered entities in your state. And they might take out another 10% or maybe more. So at the end of the day, the 340B program is completely frustrated by PBMs, their specialty pharmacies, their retail pharmacies, and by their third-party administrators. Um, let me, uh, I want to direct this question to you too, Mr. Levitt, but so we talked a little, you hit on a little bit on independent pharmacies, but I also hear uh, concerns from pharmacists in South Dakota re regarding the retroactive direct and indirect remuneration fees. And this is something that CMS took a step toward uh, providing more certainty 
to in their final rule last year by incorporating these fees in the negotiated rate. However, I know that pharmacies continue to have concerns about low reimbursement rates from PBMs, and, and, and we need to ensure that our independent pharmacies remain uh, viable, serve patients, while also ensuring that the Medicare program is a steward of taxpayer dollars by promoting value and rewarding quality. So could you, uh, in your su submission to the committee, you discussed the current performance metrics for pharmacies. Uh, I'm wondering if you could, um, and some of which you state may not benefit pharmacies or patients, how do we incentivize or reward those pharmacies that are providing high quality care to patients? Uh, the, the current system uh, that, that PBMs use, the metrics that they use for medication adherence um, is, is there's no oversight. Uh, one of the senators talked about accountability. CMS has absolutely no idea how these big insurance companies for the Medicare Part D program are evaluating uh, adherence. That's, it doesn't incentivize uh, physicians that suspense drugs or pharmacies. Um, the solution might be CMS becoming more active in understanding how uh, adherence is judged so that the pharmacies that are truly doing well serving patients uh, can, can get benefited more. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm about out of time, so I'll, um, I've got one I'd like to submit for Mr. Gibbs for the record uh, dealing with um, the things that you're doing in terms of uh, technology and um, some of the ideas that, uh, you know, you have that are impacting, hopefully could impact in a positive way the price that consumers are paying at the counter. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll submit that one for the record, but thank you. I, I, I thank my friend, and I just want to say before he goes, I think there's no question that if you were starting over today, literally starting from scratch, nobody would go out and set up what we're dealing with now. And that's part of uh, our challenge, and we're going to make it bipartisan, and that's what Senator Crapo and I have been talking about. Look forward to working with him. Senator Tillis is next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you all for being here. I spent most of my career in management consulting, supply chain optimization, strategic sourcing, all things that are relevant to this topic. For the last eight years, I've been trying to get use cases that I could follow through the entire process from the investigational new drug to the new drug application, clinical trials, manufacturing a product, going to the PBMs, going through the insurers, the healthcare providers. And in eight years, I haven't had anybody in this value chain willing to step up and go through the whole process. That suggests to me uh, that uh, Dr. Burns, that uh, there is a lot of smoke. We just don't know exactly where the fires are. But I do, for one, think that we have some use cases where the PBMs are likely to be uh, guilty of some of the fire. I think right now we probably have people across the country viewing this committee kind of like a Super Bowl watch party. You got the PBMs watching it. They're going to get hammered today. You got the other people watching it probably cheering. But every once in a while, a statement's going to be made going, ooh. Uh, we have a dysfunction here. I look at healthcare policy pretty simply. To me, there are three critical success factors. How are you going to improve access? How are you going to improve outcomes? And how are you going to reduce cost? And until we get transparency in the entire process, we're not going to make headway here. The other thing I'd like to do, Mr. Chair, is have a hearing at some point where past members, or past or current members who pass bills, have to sit where you are and the industry and all the people in the supply chain get to ask you questions about what you were thinking. They may have been a good idea, but a lot of the restrictions that we have are congressionally mandated, so we have to look in the mirror if we're going to solve this problem. Pfizer launched a rheumatoid arthritis drug at a lower cost than the originator drug. That PBM, a PBM, placed a high price, high rebate on the formulary. Gilead authorized generic versions of a brand of a branded hep C uh, drug. Um, they found that nearly half of Part D plans covered the branded versions, but the authorized generics were specifically launched to reduce patient costs. By the end of 2020, less than 20 percent of Medicare patients received either. Um, Myelin launched a generic version of life-saving cancer drug for two price points, PBM. This PBM placed a high price, high rebate drug on the formulary. Sandoz, biosimilar, same sort of outcome, higher price, higher rebate on the formulary. Amgen with Humira, widely prescribed drug, similar story. Teva, life-saving cancer drug, 
Similar story. Ab five. Same story. These are two. Uh, these are examples. Some of them widely prescribed drugs that make no sense in terms of the ultimate cost and the availability of it. I sat in a committee uh, hearing last week, I believe, with uh, Mr. Becerra saying, I think everybody in the value chain needs to be at the table to take a haircut. Now, the question is, if we do it right, that haircut will probably look more similar to Dr. Gibbs. If we do it wrong, somebody in the value chain is going to get a haircut very similar to Mr. Levitt. And uh, Mr. Levitt, I appreciate you being here, because if we get this right, you're going to have fewer clients going forward. And I think you'll be okay with that. Um, but you know, I, I, uh, this is another thing that five minutes cannot simply allow me to drill down on somebody who's written 600. That, that's the Cliff Notes version of all that we need to understand to get this policy right. Uh, but you reminded me of an experience I had going into a control burn when you said there's a lot of smoke, but you can't see the fire. When you go in a control burn on a house, you have to put your hand on the firefighter ahead of you because you're not gonna see them the minute you enter the house. But there is a fire. And my guess is there are, in some segments of the, of the supply chain, big ones, gonna be difficult to, uh, to bear out. Other ones that we can, we can have some hits, uh, the singles and doubles and get something done. But I'm telling the industry, everybody in the supply chain, there is no rational basis for us not to have use cases so we can figure out the root causes of the problem. And it's not as simple as any one. Uh, you have to go through this and figure out what their value add is. And I think over time, the PBMs have morphed. There's a lot of vertical integration now. A number of things that we have to look at if we're serious about coming up with a bipartisan proposal for solving this. Now, I'm, I'd like to reserve the right to speak with you all individually because I think your expertise uh, requires far more attention than I can give you in the remaining six seconds. So thank you for being here. I, th I thank my colleague, and as we talked about yesterday, I'm very much looking forward to working with him on this. Um, Senator Brown's next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Senator Tillis, thank you for your comments. I heard about the last two-thirds of them. Thank you for that. Uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act, we stood up to big pharma and dark money and finally began to take action to bring down the cost of prescription drugs. I thank the chairman for his leadership on that. I've been working on this my whole career, pushing for Medicare price negotiations, pushing to crack down on drug company price gouging. Their lobbyists rarely lose. They lost this time. We're seeing the same kind of action with, with railroad lobbyists, fortunately. We can build on that success to lower prices further by reforming DIR fees. It's an impenetrable system of fees most people have never heard of that make it harder for local pharmacies. We all hear from them often to serve Ohioans who count on them every day. Fees are so exorbitant in some cases, they force people's community pharmacy out of network or to close altogether. I called the administration last year to finalize its DIR fee reform proposal to help lower drug costs for seniors. CMS has acted to protect seniors' pocketbooks, but there are other problems with these fees that the rule doesn't touch. Uh, Mr. Levitt, for you, I would. Um, what, what other actions should Congress take to better protect consumers and local businesses they count on by addressing DR fees or any new practices PBMs are starting because of the CMS rule? I think that there are some, some current law um, that, that applies to Medicare Part D. Terms and conditions in Medicare Part D are supposed to be reasonable and relevant, but PBMs think that they can pay below cost to pharmacies and still get away with it. Their argument is, look, we have 68,000 pharmacies in our network. If it wasn't reasonable, they'd all drop out. But they are dropping out. So I would like CMS to clarify some current guidance. The guidance that says reimbursement rates must be reasonable, I'd like CMS to clarify to PBMs that that means that the reimbursement rate actually must be reasonable. Thank you. Another concern I have with the RFEs is that pharmacies are paid or forced to pay, be forced to pay based on quality measures. That sounds great, but I also hear from pharmacists in Ohio these measures are often inconsistent, sometimes just don't make sense. Some pharmacies, as I think you know from your head nod, Mr. Levitt, learn about these quality measures only after it's too late to address them. Elaborate on that, would you? Sure. These uh, DR fees are based on uh, performance. They're supposed to be based on performance of pharmacies. But 50% of DR fees plus are paid by specialty pharmacies. 
And the PBMs do not know how to measure adherence for specialty drugs. I think they do it intentionally wrong. Sometimes they do it themselves instead of outsourcing adherence. Um, if we had more time, I could, I could give you specific examples. Uh, but I think CMS, uh, CMS has no idea how these PBMs are judging adherence. I think CMS should take a look. We sometimes ask the PBMs in depositions, do you, have you gone to CMS and asked them whether you're doing adherence measurements correctly? There's no communication between CMS and these big PBMs on DIR fees, including on the net reimbursement rate after the DIR fee. Uh, thank you. One of, one of the biggest problems with our whole prescription drug system, and I think all five of you know this, is how opaque it is. A few companies dominate each part of the, just a few companies dominate each part of the supply chain, which is far more convoluted than it needs to be, always, always frankly, to the benefit of the big drug companies. Even the experts are mostly guessing about what's happening behind closed doors. It's the pharmaceutical companies, again, all to their benefit. I'm proud that my state is in some ways taking the lead in tackling some of these problems. Ohio's getting some $100 million in overcharges back from PBMs. Early this week, we sued one of the mysterious group purchasing organizations, GPOs that are owned by PBMs and used to take dollars from the pockets of people who simply need their medications. It's unacceptable that these shadowy uh, secretive entities have so much power over people's health care. Mr. Levitt, talk, talk for the last couple minutes. How do GPOs operate? How do they contribute to the drug cost problem for everyday Americans? So if every single manufacturer that wants to get their drug onto a PBM's list of drugs that the PBM makes available to their big plan sponsors has to pay a rebate to get on formulary. So PBMs use that, that formulary as a tool to extract dollars from manufacturers. Sometimes if a manufacturer might resist, they might say, no, we don't want to pay you rebate. PBM says, we're not going to put you on formulary. Or maybe we will, but we're going to make your copay tier three, which means no one's going to want to buy your drug. Or we might use step edits or prior authorization so that, pharma so that physicians have a very tough time getting your drug onto formulary. So these rebate aggregators, no one knows how much money they actually take out of the system. So to be clear, these rebates that are collected by PBMs are not fully turned over to the plan sponsors or maybe even to the government. They're retained in the middle. Thank you. I thank my colleague, and I appreciate the, the fact we've been working on these issues for a long time. And I would just say to my colleagues, these are complicated. There are questions of transparency and accountability. You always know whose side Senator Brown is on. Senator Brown is always on the side of the working families and the senior citizens. I told the story the other day about how we got the price gouging penalties. You know, finally, and we're already starting to see breaks for consumers. I mean, you have poster child, the poster kids for these drugs like Humira, and we're starting to see price reductions. So I thank my colleague for all his good work. Uh, I understand Senator Whitehouse, in his usual magnanimous way, is saying that he'd like Senator Cortez Mastow to go first. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, first of all, let me just uh, reiterate what my colleagues have said. This is a great panel, and I hope this is one of many discussions we are having because it takes more than five minutes to <laughs> really dive into the issues here. So I appreciate everyone being here. Uh, I, I also want to thank um, our chairman and, and, and Senator Crapo, um, not only for holding the, this hearing, but uh, really the work that we've done historically in this committee together um, to lower drug prices for so many across the country and continue to do. Um, today, I am introducing uh, legislation um, called the Lower Drugs Cost for Families Act, and what it will do is penalize pharmaceutical companies for increasing uh, the price uh, uh, of their drugs faster than the rate of inflation for patients in both the private health insurance market as well as Medicare. I think that's so important is what we're talking about today. Uh, we have heard uh, PBMs often prefer higher uh, price drugs to reap in administrative fees. We've heard that today uh, on a percentage of a drug's price. We know that health plans have incentives to limit overall drug spending. We've seen that as well. Um, and we've also heard that PBMs get paid both by their health plan clients and by the drug companies they negotiate with. And this raises a serious questions as to whether PBMs are serving the best interests uh, of their clients, including union health funds. Um, obviously, transparency is key. That's what we're hearing about. But um, Dr. Gibbs, 
Let me ask you this, because um, you note in your testimony that Capital Rx has both financially and clinically aligned interests with its clients. As a PBM working with union payers, I'm curious about your perspective here as well. Um, how is your PBM model different, and what does that mean for the patients? Thank you, Senator, for your question. Um, we work off what's called a single ledger model. We don't have to keep two separate sets of books, which have been referred to in many different aspects here today. Um, what we reimburse the pharmacies is what we bill our clients. What we receive from pharmaceutical contracts is passed back to our clients 100%. Where that can be validated is with Consolidation, Consolidated Appropriations Act. PBMs had to report their third-party margin spread at retail. They had to report their rebates that were, were retained on specific clients. So the data is now there as of January 31st of this year. I don't know what the Department of Labor or CMS intends to do with that, mm -hmm. but that will shine the first light on what PBMs are making in this space, and I proudly put zeros in both of those columns. Mm -hmm. and, and so can I ask you... Um, what else should we be learning from your model that you've heard today uh, that we haven't discussed, that we should be aware of? <clears throat> I think first and foremost and is the fact that the supply chain is complex mm -hmm. because the basis is wrong. The fact that at wholesale acquisition costs, which is kind of the starting point of drug pricing, when, I, when we actually survey pharmacies, their price is lower than that doesn't make sense. A pharmacy doesn't buy lower than the wholesaler. So that should tell us right away that we're starting off at a place that is nonsensical. And until we fix that, everything else we're talking about is gray noise. We have to fix the cost basis of drug pricing in this country. Rebates, well, everything ties to that. Rebates tie to WAC. Wholesaler price ties to WAC. ADBP goes to pharmacy sometimes. Mm -hmm. So until that is all defined and uh, and revealed and becomes transparent, um, the rest of the fixes are going to continue to be in a spiral, in my opinion. Thank you. And, and uh, you know, it's true. In Nevada, like every other state, work, I'm hearing from Nevadans, from our patients, from our pharmacies, all on the same issue. So it's not something that's unique to any one state. We, we have to figure this out. And I so appreciate the conversation today. I look forward to more of it so we could really address this issue. And I'm going to yield the remainder of my time to my good colleague here. Thank you. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Senator Crapo. Thank you, Senator Cortez Masto. And thank you all for uh, being here. Um, there's an obvious logic that Dr. Gibbs represents here of having PBMs as an organized counterweight to the power of the pharmaceutical industry, which otherwise dominates. Uh, the danger is that um, a pharmacy benefit manager, once they're interposed between the pharmaceutical company and the customer, can become just a toll taker or just a self-dealer and extract more money out of the transactions than any market principle would justify. And it gets a little bit worse than that because if they're going that way, there's also the prospect that either through coordination or just through happy coexistence, uh, the pharmaceutical companies can artificially inflate their prices to get paid more. That allows pharmacy benefit managers to get a bigger share of the savings that are at this point fake savings. The pharmaceutical industry is happy because it's making more money. The PBMs are happy because they're making more money. Nobody's blowing the whistle on the initial price being a phony because the PBMs who are supposed to fight the initial price are actually in on the economics of the transaction and the consumer once again takes it uh, in the neck. So um, I'm very interested in following up on what more in the way of transparency um, and guardrails we can do to prevent those behaviors and highlight them when they happen. Um, Mr. Levitt, as a lawyer, I'm particularly interested in where you think some of our agencies might have a more robust role than they're presently exercising, like, for instance, our friends at the Department of Justice. Um, and I'll ask you about that in a minute, but 
um, and give you the closing words. But I also want to point out that uh, as I sort of step back and observe this phenomenon of uh, concern about pharmacy benefit managers, um, while it's possible that big pharma and big PBM are uh, orchestrating high prices that they can share and not doing their jobs about proper pricing, um, I think there's also a bit of competition going on here in that big pharma would like nothing more than to have the American concern about their prices be diverted to concern about PBM behavior so that we take our eye off the ball of how big pharma is pricing its products. And I think the window we created in the Inflation Reduction Act to actually start real negotiations and get a bit of a better look under the hood is going to help cure that problem. But I urge all of my colleagues not to take our eye off the ball of pharma pricing as we look into the question of PBM behavior. And with that, uh, Mr. Levitt, back to you on where you think uh, the executive branch of government could be uh, operating more effectively in this space and how. I think uh, PBMs, for one of the things they do is they earn, it's been called an administrative fee and data fee. There's a safe harbor for, to, for those fees. There's a law about that. In order to be safe in that harbor, these PBMs are supposed to follow the rules, and they're not following the rules because these are percentage-based uh, fees that they're taking. I also think the executive branch should take a look at the Medicare bids submitted by these prescription drug plans. We talked a lot about here about the different pricing. Um, there was a, a cancer drug mentioned that was a couple thousand dollars versus um, a generic. Uh, a, a nonprofit company had a generic that was, you know, a, a couple hundred dollars. I, I think that when you bid, uh, when when these prescription drug plans bid Medicare, somebody should look at those bids. They should compare them to uh, to things like Mark Cuban cost plus drug or this uh, this. This private, this um, uh, this company that has a very cheap drug. So, I think looking at uh, safe harbors, looking at the bids, and I think the DOJ absolutely should take a look at rebate aggregators to see just how much money is being pulled out, especially when it relates to Medicare Part D. And when you say take a look at the uh, Medicare bids, you're meaning a very practical look, comparing what the bid is for this particular drug in isolation against similar uh, drugs or treatments that, or perhaps other bids that they've made uh, in other places, um, just to give a reality check that it's for real. Exactly. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chairman Crapo. Thank you. Senator Lankford. Thanks. Thanks for the marathon that y'all are on at, at this point today. Uh, you're crossing the two-hour mark of us pummeling you with questions. Let me, let me pummel you with a few more on this. Mr. Levin, I'm going to come back to you because you're sufficiently warmed up there on it. And it's the issue of tiering that's come in. This has been an area that I've been working on for a while. The, the drug companies complain about the PBMs until they cooperate with them for tiering. Uh, that when it's time for a drug to go generic, uh, once the generic's about to be released, the PBM and the, and the branded drug, uh, they negotiate together some way to get a higher rebate fee if they'll put the generic drug on the branded tier which means the copay for the consumer is more, and it also is a higher cost uh, from Medicare at that point. This has been an issue. They're literally driving generic companies out and driving the prices higher for the consumer. At the same time, the PBM will come back and say, we're negotiating to get better prices for the consumer when they're actually not. Where am I wrong on this? I, I can see no fault in any of that logic. Okay, so how do we, how do we solve this? I, I, earlier was talked about accountability. I'm not sure who's looking at these formularies. I mean, if it's a Medicare formula, I think C, CMS has outsourced Medicare to these private companies, completely outsourced with very little oversight. So I think that CMS should look hard at this tiering issue you talked about. Also, honestly, in this self-funded plan space, I think big employer groups need to more carefully examine what their contracts say and what PBMs are doing. Okay. I, I would also, let me add one more element as well. Th there's been some studies and some conversation about what PBMs do to independent pharmacies, especially with the DIR fees, uh, with all the new quality basis that they literally invent every month or quarter. Uh, they'll retroactively change all their requirements on them. Uh, but it, it's been remarkable to me how many independent pharmacists have told me the same crazy story that they get a change in quality, they get a drive down in price, and then within about two weeks, they'll get a call 
from one of the PBM owned pharmacies and saying, hey, we're trying to expand into your area. Would you like to merge into our pharmacy? Would you like to become one of us? So my challenge is a couple ways. What PBMs are doing, I believe, are actually driving our independent pharmacies and our rural pharmacies into submission or gone uh, from there, and that's a real problem. And the second thing we've seen, even VA recently, uh, cooperating with a PBM uh, to basically cut off thousands of rural pharmacies around the country and say, you're no longer going to do VA benefits. You've got to do mail order through our PBM to be able to do it, which will kill our pharmacies. Have you seen this as just independent stories or has anyone seen this as an actual trend that's going on? The, the story you told about PBMs aggressively auditing a, a independent pharmacy and then offering to buy that pharmacy, I, I've seen that for 10 years. I've seen that trend. The irony also, Senator, is that when PBMs buy these pharmacies, they're literally buying them with their own money because PBMs have these DRF fees that are pure profit, and it, it has fueled this, uh, this proliferation of PBMs buying, uh, buying up pharmacies. The thing about uh, the VA and TRICARE, I think, you know, I looked at those, uh, the, the, whatever information is public about the TRICARE bid, I was able to see. There was two PBMs that bid for the TRICARE business. That's one of the biggest contracts in the country. I cannot figure that out, but someone's got to look at that. That's worth a follow-up from there. The, the, the question is, is out there always. When we talk to any of the PBMs and we say, we need greater transparency. Uh, we need to know more about the pharmacy reimbursement, the manufacturer rebates. We, we need that. Their response is always the same. Well, that's going to hurt the consumer. If we give you greater transparency, the consumer is going to be hurt. Now, we never, we never get an answer of what that really means. Where are they coming from on that, and does it really hurt the consumer if there's greater transparency in the PBMs? And I'll let anyone answer that that wants to be able to answer that. Mr. Burns, Dr. Burns. Well, th there's pr uh, plenty of research that shows when you start uh, mandating transparency, especially of prices, there's always a danger of collusion among the people who are uh, revealing those prices. So you always have to watch out for that. And studies show that a lot, of the, a lot of the transparency movement, which has been going on for 20 years, hasn't really benefited consumers because most consumers don't know what to do with the information. Right. The, the challenge that we have is, obviously, the consumer is paying a higher price, and we all know it. The spread pricing is real. We all know it. Uh, the percentage uh, per, uh, that they're being paid is a very real issue. The rebates are not going back to the consumer. Uh, we all know all those things, and anytime we try to step in and say, okay, so let's provide some transparency to find out what's actually how many dollars are there, they're like, oh, that's going to hurt the consumer, as if everything they're already doing is not hurting the consumer. But suddenly that piece becomes the, oh, that's going to be bad for the consumer. So th this is an issue I'm glad this committee is taking on. I'm glad y'all are here. We've got a lot more work to do. We discussed this four years ago and have done nothing about it so far. I am grateful to the Biden administration and CMS and some of the things that they're currently doing on DIR fees to step in, but it's not far enough. And we have some additional work to be able to do in this area. So I appreciate all the preparation that y'all did uh, for this hearing and grateful we're having it. Thanks y'all. Thank you. Senator Warren. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Chair. So last year, Congress passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which finally gives HHS the authority to negotiate drug prices for a select number of high-priced brand name drugs. And this is a significant achievement, and one that drug companies paid their lobbyists about $150 million to avoid. That's one of the signals that it probably will have some effect. Despite these wins, there is more that we need to do to reduce exorbitant drug prices for all Americans, and that includes taking a hard look at the pharmacy benefit managers that we've been talking about, the PBMs, that negotiate discounts from manufacturers on behalf of insurance plans, putting upward pressure on list prices. But we also can't lose sight of the ways that drug companies continue to abuse our intellectual property laws to drive out competition, to jack up prices, and to protect their profits. So in a competitive market, we would expect to see a lot of patent applications for new drugs as companies race to invent the next blockbuster product. Professor Feldman, does that describe the patent landscape for pharmaceuticals right now? Uh, Senator, that, that's not really what we're seeing right now. Um, Companies are largely recycling and repurposing existing drugs today. To cite one study, 
78% of the drugs associated with new patents aren't new drugs coming on the market. They are existing ones. Well, we're, we're seeing a lot of churn. So, so think about that. More than three out of four new patent applications for pharmaceuticals are for existing drugs, which means adding new patents for things like new formulations or manufacturing methods or even certain restrictions on a drug, but not actually for new drug compounds, new drugs, into the, into the field. So let's say that a drug company manufactures a pill and the patent for this pill is just about to expire. Instead of facing competition, the company decides it will make the delayed release version of the drug so that it goes into effect just a little while after the pill is ingested. Even though it is the exact same drug, the company patents the new formulation and then removes the original from the market. Dr. Feldman, could that restart the clock on the drug's monopoly protections? Yes, that, that would effectively restart the clock. Okay, so drug companies use these tricks and a lot of others to keep their monopolies and keep pushing prices higher and higher and higher. Now, the Inflation Reduction Act exempts drugs from Medicare negotiation for the first seven or 11 years, depending on the kind of drug, following that initial approval. Recognizing the potential for gaming, CMS has issued guidance saying it will use the earliest approval of all the formulations of a drug to determine its eligibility for the program. Professor Feldman, without this step, could drug companies use these patent tricks to ensure that their drugs never become eligible for the Medicare negotiation provision in the IRA? So product copying is a serious concern with regulations like that. With CMS guidance is a very important step for ensuring that companies can't evade the impact of the law by simply changing the packaging of the drug or shifting to from 20 milligrams to 40 milligrams. Wow. We, don't, we must ensure that drug companies don't rely on tricks in order to avoid competition. I support this step from CMS. I'm glad to hear that you do. Um, but the administration can do more to limit patent abuses without Congress, and they can do it for a wider range of drugs than just the handful of drugs that are currently subject to Medicare negotiations. We need to scrutinize the PBMs, but using existing administrative tools to end abusive drug company monopolies would give patients faster, broader relief from high drug prices. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. My colleague, all right? We, we, have you completed your time? I have. And we'll give you water. <laughs> all right. Senator Blackburn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here uh, today. And I want to return to this issue of patient steering. I, I think that, I, and I know that Senator Langford touched on that, and I constantly hear from Tennesseans um, how frustrated they are with the PBMs. You know, in all, in all transparency, I would do away with the PBMs. I think they're unnecessary. And when patients are being steered, when patients are not able to reap the benefit of that, that um, reduced price and they continue to pay higher prices, it is something that is very difficult. And I uh, had looked at the Ohio suit. I think, Mr. Levitt, your testimony had referenced that. And I know their chief, Kroger's chief medical officer, lives in Nashville. And, uh, you know, when they can't turn a profit and they muddy up the process um, for the PBMs have muddied the process and they're pushing that business offshore. I think that it is difficult. I do, uh, Mr. Levitt, let me come to you on that. Let's talk for a little bit on what this does to Medicare and Medicaid when you have this steering that is going on because you have people in rural Tennessee that this is happening and then they have no access 
So I'd love to hear just a touch from you on that. Time's limited. The under Medicare Part D, there is a federal any willing provider law that well, that's is my next question. So let's go ahead and hit that because um, you know we have um, any willing provider in Tennessee, which limits the PBMs. And so would should we just blanket that federally? Yes, uh, the, um, the, it is. It is good federal law. And Tennessee, you've actually passed one of the strongest state any willing provider laws in the country, which is phenomenal for for practices and, and pharmacies in your state. Um, and the steering is is terrible, particularly in, for sick patients, the sickest patients like cancer patients. We have examples uh, in your state where a, a patient who has the a patient choice to go to the oncologist that they want to get the drug from is steered to a PBM-owned specialty pharmacy, and then they just get this oral oncolytic, which is a dangerous drug in the mail. It's terrible for patient care. Well, we think it is too, and we think that any willing provider has helped in uh, so many instances. Let's continue down this same chain, because with a lot of our community health centers, uh, what we hear is that the PBMs get in here and it really compromises the uh, availability of pharmaceuticals and cramps uh, the community health centers on patient care. And I'd love to hear you comment for a moment on that. Are these federally qualified health centers? Yeah, and community health centers in rural areas, yes. It's uh, these. Um, I, I'm not an expert on the on the federally qualified health centers. Okay. Well, with our community health centers in rural areas, anybody else want to weigh in on that? Because go ahead, Ms. Feldman. Sure. I would just like to talk about the what's happening with the community um, pharmacies. Yeah. One of the one of the techniques we've talked about um, in the hearing is clawbacks, and so with that. Um, the PBM actually asks for money back from the pharmacy. Um, sometimes the pharmacist loses money on the transaction. Now, if the PBM owns the pharmacy, money's just going from one pocket into the other. It doesn't matter. But for a community pharmacist, it can drive them out of business. These are the types of techniques that are reducing the number of community pharmacies we have and limiting patient choice and access well, to medicine. Well, and also what we're seeing is because PBMs uh, have a role. What is happening is we have less in the 340B programs. And that is something that when you've got 230 health center, community health centers in your state, and you have the PBMs uh, stepping in and it hurts the 340B um, programs that they have because basically you're taking those savings away. I know there's been a lot of talk about uh, vertical integration and um, today, and we have monitored that. I will tell you we're quite concerned about what we see there, because anytime you have um, a, another step in that vertical integration, what you end up seeing is higher prices for consumers and then you have less access, and it convolutes the market. So thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Um, I understand that Senator Johnson is either on his way or he would like to hold uh, us to hold for him. All right. Let's Johnson staff here. Is that the, the desire of the senator? Okay. Well, then I'll kind of jump the wrap up and give you kind of my thoughts here about what we'd like to work with you all on. And uh, put it this way, uh, I'm heading back to Oregon in a few hours. And then over the next 10 days or so, I'm going to be having town hall meetings across my state, you know, primarily in rural areas. We have them open to all. You can ask anything you want. I've had 1,045 of them in my time in office. It's something I pledged in every county, every year. You throw open the doors. 
And people care a whole lot about this matter of getting mugged at the pharmacy counter. They don't get it. And they look at the prices around the world and several of my colleagues compared them to, to other countries. And they certainly don't get all the medical lingo that we have been speaking about today. Rebates, DIR fees, putting things in hoppers or hopping around or some such thing. People don't get that kind of thing. But they do understand these examples where what you're seeing just defies common sense and fairness. And whatever it was a couple hours ago, I cited this example of Civica and how it affects Part D, which is Medicare. You know, I'm one of the people who voted for Part D. Got a lot of flack for voting for Part D. I thought it was important to get started because it you know, covered people, it helped people, but clearly hadn't done enough for cost containment. And what we were told again a couple of hours ago is Civica, a nonprofit, sells a generic prostate drug for $160. The average price that PBMs charge Medicare Part D plans for the exact same drug is over $3,000. And yet, Civica can't get the big three PBMs to cover the drug. So that means that people on Medicare and taxpayers are paying for medicine that is marked up almost 2,000%. So I'm going to take that home, and I'm going to go into these rural communities, bright red politically, and they're going to want something done about this. They're going to want something done about this. And I think, while I wait for my colleague, and I'm wrapping this up, I'd be interested. We can go down the panel. What do you think, if you can do one thing going forward, just one thing, to end something that is so unconscionable. You know, taxpayers, seniors facing a 2,000% markup, and this is not kind of some abstract theory. This is what we were given as an example to highlight today and how Medicare Part D gets hammered. And Medicare is our flagship health program. We've got a lot of challenges demographics, given the number of people who turn 65 every day. So we'll wait for Senator Johnson, but I think I'd be interested. We'll start with Ms. Friedman, but everybody, as we wrap up after three hours, everybody take a crack at your, your idea, because I can tell you what we're going to do during the uh, work period at home. Our staffs, Democratic and Republican, are going to be talking among themselves, so we can see if we can go from the constructive discussion with all of you and with the members and really come up with practical steps uh, for what to do. So why don't you all just go right down. You've got one crack at dealing with that outrageous example of the nonprofit versus um, what PBMs charge, uh, charge Medicare. And then when Senator Johnson comes, we'll break for that. We'll start with you, Ms. Friedman. We'll go down the row. So may I offer you one other um, example to take back to your constituents? Yeah, I, I, I think I'd rather get... To the one. Yeah, I'd rather get... Here comes Senator Johnson. Ah. We're going to give Senator... And then that gives you more time to think. Okay? Senator Johnson is going to use his time for questions, and then I won't be doing any more speechifying other than to hear your response to what I asked. Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing. This has been fascinating. I wish I could have spent more time here, but I did hear the testimony. Uh, Dr. Burns, I always like starting out with the macro. Okay, let's take a look at the overall industry. Uh, latest information I have, according to the AMA, in 2021, we spent about $4.3 trillion on health care. Is that? We're, we're over $4 trillion. That's correct. Um, and also about $577 billion on pharmaceuticals, gross. Totally. It, it depends on how you measure retail versus institutions. So what, what, do you think the, what do you think the number is? 
Well, it's, it could be. If you look just at the retail numbers that come out of CMS, people will say, well, it's about 10 percent, 11 percent of health care spending. But if you throw in the, in the institutional side of it, the drugs that are used in hospitals, you could get up to 15 or 16 percent of national health care. So, so about a half trillion dollars is somewhere in the ballpark. What, what do you think the after-tax profitability in total of that amount is? Well, it varies by sector. There are I so understand, many... but I mean, in total, would you say, again, Total industry after tax profitability is probably average about 5%. Well, let's say drugs more, maybe it might be 10%. Well, no, the pharmaceutical companies and the medical device companies clean up. Okay, they're so in, would it be they're in, would they're after, in the low 20%. Okay, so again, I'm, I'm talking about after tax because let's face yeah, it, true. the tax that the government collects is, yeah. goes right back into our coffers yeah. as well. So but let's say it's 20%. Yeah. On, on a half trillion, that's about $100 billion. On a total spend in healthcare by 4.3 trillion, so we're talking somewhere two, two and a half percent in terms of profitability of the drugs, in terms of you know our overall healthcare spending. I make the point because it's easy for us to zero in on a particular problem. Again, I think PBMs. This is a really interesting hearing. Okay, um, but you eliminate all the profitability and, and all the incentives for create new drugs. You haven't really made a dent in our healthcare spend. Is that Pretty accurate? Well, the, the real issue now facing the Part D plans and their beneficiaries are the high cost specialty drugs for which there are no competitors. And that's where the, the elderly are getting cream right. in terms of their out of pocket costs. What we need there is more competition among those sorts of manufacturers. There you go. D don't, don't we also need more consumer involvement? I think, Mr. Gibbs, I think you were talking in your testimony that unlike every other product, and that may be a little bit too broad, but almost like every other product in uh, our economy, we don't know what things cost in drugs. And, and again, I think that's a generally true statement, but I guess I, I would argue that the reason for that is because the third party payer system where consumers pay about 10% of all of our goods and services in healthcare, 10%. No, nobody cares what any of this stuff costs. If they did, you'd have tr price transparency just through the marketplace, correct? I mean, anybody want to disagree with that? How about the attorney who sues these guys? No, I would totally agree with it. And it's basically, if everybody's covered by insurance, and more than 90% of the population are, they don't really care about the cost. So the solution, again, we, yeah, I, I would argue the biggest problem with PBMs is we have Medicare and their formularies, and it makes us so unbelievably complex. I'm an accountant, okay? I actually understand numbers. I understand, I've had, I've had people try to explain this to me, and like, you know, Professor uh, Burns, you know, you've written books on this stuff and you're just sort of kind of getting your arms around this, okay? Markets are complex. If you let a competitive market system with consumers participating in it, you'll get trans price transparency just as a natural part of it as opposed to trying to suss it out through government regulations, which we've been trying to do and it just doesn't work. Well, as I wrote in uh, the textbook I published two years ago, consumerism and consumer literacy just haven't shown up yet. So we do want drug companies to produce new molecules to save lives. I mean, we want that R&D. So there has to be a profit motive in there. One thing that I found out during the pandemic is how completely unlevel the playing field is between generics and the patentable drugs. Part of, the, part of the problem is now it has to be random controlled trials is the, is the only standard. They won't, they won't accept observational, you know, meta-analysis of that. So the playing field is totally tipped toward patentable drugs. And so we're, we're, all these molecules that are there, doctors oftentimes can't use. And of course, we found with some, some generic drugs that uh, my experience working with doctors worked really well in, uh, in COVID. We're now out, and I'm highly concerned. I've actually, I'm the author of Right to Try. I've also authored another bill now, Right to Treat. It shouldn't be necessary, but I get just your opinion in terms of allowing doctors to use their medical judgment. So something like 20% of all drugs are, are prescribed off-label. That's how you get generic drugs more readily used, more looked at by the medical profession, and, and hopefully, with, with more observational studies to prove their efficacy or if there are problems with it. I mean, we've got to produce research on generics and
try and use those as much as possible. And anybody want to argue with that? Totally agree. The last thing you want to do is second guess what the doctors are doing at the at the bedside or the point of care. Uh, the thing I would have mentioned is that it's not necessarily patentable versus generic drugs. We oftentimes have a lot of biological drugs, specialty medicines that are off patent, and the price rises continue there because there are no effective competitors. Yeah. So again, I'm private sector guy. Competition solves an awful lot of problems, and we just don't have the competition, and certainly not in the PBM market. So again, I really, really do appreciate all your testimony here. Uh, this is very interesting. Uh, I wish it was a little bit clearer than mud. Uh, may, maybe I missed some stuff, and maybe you clarified this entire issue. But you know, again, I'll, I'll point out again, the marketplace, the third, the third party payer system, those are at odds in terms of transparency, and that's what we really need to move toward. So th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank my colleague. Um, Ms. Feldman, my apologies. I think I didn't look down at, um, at the name tags earlier. We're glad you're here. Everybody, take one crack at um, what you would say to the fact that there's nearly a 2,000% markup, a markup that hits seniors, hits Part D, hits taxpayers, and ought to be a symbol. You know, I, I can just tell you, I'm going to go out and have all these town hall meetings, and I'm going to hold that up. Is that's the real world today of people getting clobbered after you hear all the lingo about you know, rebates and exotic fees and, and all the rest. It's about a markup of 2,000%. 2,000% to hit seniors and to hit taxpayers. And it ought to be something that we use as kind of a theme to get this thing fixed. Ms. Feldman, right down the line, everybody gets one, one idea to put into this. And we're going to have to build a coalition, Mr. Jo uh, Senator Johnson wasn't here when we talked about it, Senator Crapo and I said, we're gonna take the best ideas from both sides, the staffs are gonna work on it over these two weeks and just gonna keep our foot to the pedal because I think it's a good hearing. I didn't hear a bad question in the House, to tell you the truth, from my colleagues, and I thought your answers were, were thoughtful. So um, we're gonna dig in here. Ms. Feldman, start us off. Your one, one answer to this challenge. Perverse incentive happens when interests aren't aligned. The PBM's interests are not aligned for the patient, so make sure the duties are clear that they have to be. Okay. Dr. Van Nuys? I'm going to go back to that federal benchmark of prices across different transaction points in the supply chain, like we have NADAC, make those public in other places in the supply chain so we can tell whether that 2,000 markup is happening in the spread, is it happening in the specialty pharmacy. Making public yeah. the information in the supply chain. Yeah, okay. exactly. Good. Dr. Burns. Yes, um, I would fix Part D. Uh, two things in Part D. One is the prices. Uh, that are paid ought to be pegged to net prices, not list prices. Secondly, health plans need to have more skin in the game, more fiscal responsibility in the catastrophic phase. Okay. Mr. Levitt. More transparency for the PBMs, more transparency for the rebate aggregators on both the spread pricing on the drug side and the rebate side as well. Okay. Dr. Gibbs. I agree with Dr. Van Eyes once again. Um, price should be made public, and everyone should be able to see it at any time. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to, um, and, and by the way, it's the practice of the committee to hold the record open um, for, it'll be five days, I believe, and, uh, and uh, senators can, uh, is that the correct number of days? Um, a business week, yes. A business week. We'll hold the uh, record open. Uh, for members to offer their, their questions. Uh, those of you that want to submit additional uh, inf information, please feel uh, free to do so. This has been a good, good hearing. I want us to look back and say that today was the day that we started to get this fixed. And I'll welcome your ideas and suggestions, and uh, the stakes are high, and uh, I thank you for uh, participating. And with that, the Finance Committee is adjourned.